We've been doing some, <clears throat> excuse me, good and great things with working hand in hand with the police, trying to curb crime and, and, and get a better relationship with community and police. And I must say that we're doing a great job there. As we all know, police brutality here in Atlantic City has been down. We had very little um, complaints from internal affairs, you know, people filing complaints against our officers. Um, so we're doing a very good job. Um, like I said, I've been here in Atlantic City all my life. I've been involved with the community ever since I was 19. And I think now it's time for me to get involved, you know, get elected as council so I can do a little bit more what I have already been doing. Thank you. So we do have a number of questions for you. The first one being, what would be two priorities that you would have on city council? Our first priority is to deter crime more in, in Atlantic City. Um, to, 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 to figure out and come up with other ways that we can give our younger adults in Atlantic City something else to do, something for, um, you know, to just something else to do than what we have them doing now in the last city. My second um, is to um, create jobs here in the last city to help bring businesses here in the last city and to get more people working here in the last city. Thank you. The next question, what ideas do you have for youth initiatives in the city? Uh, say that one more time, sorry, repeat that. Sure, what ideas do you have for youth initiatives in Atlantic City? Well, we, 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 we um, starting to remodel the, uh, the playground back there on Maryland and Brigantine Boulevard. And I have been walking the community, speaking with some youth about what do they want to see there and, and, and what can, uh, you know, would better benefit them. Um, a couple of ideas came out of it. They wanted to start back the um, little league baseball teams back there. They want to do a, a, a tag football thing back there. Um, just, just a lot of good ideas to get our youth thinking about positive things and working towards positive things. One of the things that I find being here in the second war in one of the roughest areas they, they consider in Atlantic City that a lot of, it's just not really nothing to do that the children is interested in. All of our children don't want to be basketball players. You know, some want to be hockey players. So I'm, I'm going to bring different um, programs and ideas in our community to uh, hopefully get their attention and, and get them, you know, something that they would be interested in. You mentioned creating jobs earlier. There was a few questions that I want to kind of dig into that a little bit deeper. What is your vision to increase more jobs in Atlantic City? And what are those steps that you would take to make that deliberate action toward creating more jobs in the city? Well, well to create more jobs in the city is to bring business here in Atlantic City, new businesses and um, opportunities here in Atlantic City. So that would be my one of my, my strongest points on the on the um, on the board is to, to to look at all these different um, uh, businesses that want to come to Atlantic City, make sure that they're the right business for our people in Atlantic City, and to just create good and well-paying jobs for our residents here in Atlantic City. What is your vision regarding community policing? I, I was the founder of the Land City Community Watch some 20 something years where we had, um, it was unfortunately after the death of Shirley April Gates back here. So me and a couple of fellas decided to start a community watch program, which was a tremendous good program. And we started with creating community policing. I said, oh, if, community, if we have community policing here in our, in our community, the um, communication is better between residents and the police because they actually know each and every resident back here, and then the residents get to know a police officer. And we found out to work very, very well. So I'm a strong advocate on community policing. How will you stay in touch with the residents of your ward? Walking, 
often. They see me every day walking my ward, either going back and forth to the store. They stop me now. Uh, it'd be always before to ask questions and then and to um, get my help on different things. And so I'm always visible and I'm always will be visible and I always I will be out here for my residents of the second ward. And not just the residents of the second ward, the whole Atlanta city. Do you support the administration's efforts of testing sites for COVID-19 in Atlantic City? Why or why not? If not, what is your testing plan? You said, do I support it? Do you support it? Yes, I do. Why or why not? I support it because I think it's important to find out how many of our residents is affected by the COVID-19. So I, I support the uh, the testing both sites wholeheartedly. When you think about some of the concerns in Atlantic City, uh, some of the concerns that you're hearing um, amongst your neighbors, what are those top three, top four concerns that you're hearing, and what are ways in which you can address that? Well, one of the top concerns that I hear is about there's not there's not enough for the young adults or the younger children to do in the last year to keep them occupied off the streets and out of trouble. Um, the other concern is about how the city has been so going downhill for some years now, and it's not like they remember it to be and how it used to be and so forth and so on. And that's because of <laughs> the election the way the elections has been running with, with, with the, um, you know, the absentee balance and so on and so forth. You, 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 the residents will go to the polls and chose the person they want to serve. And then it turn around and then that person that they went to the polls to vote for loses because of these absentee balance that comes in. So I found out that a lot of my residents back here or in the second ward are really set up with that. They like, well, how do why do we chose somebody and then this come along and they totally switch what we chose it or however they, you know it is. But that's one of their main concerns. They're tired of going out there voting and they feel that they vote don't count. Any other concerns that you're hearing? Any other concerns? What other concerns are you hearing and how do you plan to address that? Well, like I said, is to create some programs for the for the concerns about the children, nothing to do, nothing for the children to do here, and so on and so forth. I plan on doing some um, different programs, you know, and, and listening to my residents to, to give me some input on what they would like to see and, and how we can go about it. I'm, I'm I'm very picky and 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 and, and really uh, passionate about working with the residents. I don't want to throw nothing on my residents. I will meet with them all the time and get their ideas and work together with them what would be best for our community. You mentioned uh, just a minute ago that the city is going downhill. Um, so there's been some things that I guess you want to improve, but what are those things that you do like that you want to continue on in your role um, if, if chosen for the seat? Well, one thing I, I I I love my city, and I know what what, what it can become again. Um, it, it's a lot I love about a land city, but it's also a lot that I I don't like about it. So my 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 idea is is to try to just make it better for for all of for all the residents in Atlantic City. Um, you know, like I said, I'm ready to work hard. I'm always been a hard worker. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get a land city back to where it needs to be. And I understand that we have some people on the board that's really fighting, that really love a land city. But then you got some other people on the board that really don't care about a land city. How could we get ahead if we don't, if, if we always tossing in and fighting among each other? Do you have any concerns um, as it relates to education in Atlantic City for our students um, and ideas on how to improve um, or whether you think it needs improvement? What are your ideas on that? 
Well, well, Atlantic, the, the school system was a little shaky, but I see that it was some improvement in the school system, especially with the um, Atlantic City High School. We was having some issues there with, with, with the students and stuff. But I see that the city and the Board of Education had made some changes regarding the high school and some of the um, elementary schools. So I'm going to sit back and, 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 and watch and see where that goes and see how much improvement can happen. Um, as we know, we've been into this pandemic, so school's been out right now, so I haven't been hearing anything about the schools right now. But I think with the little changes that they did make, uh, I got to give them a chance to improve, you know, where they need to be approved at. Can you talk a little bit about the changes that they did make that you want to see um, how it kind of shakes out? Well, then I just want to just sit and wait and see how it, how it shakes out. I understand that uh, the high school has a new principal now, um, and there's a lot of issues coming from the high school with uh, mostly with the with the territorial thing, with the little I'm from here, you from there, and then fighting and all that kind of stuff. So, like I said, um, I'm just going to wait and see how you know how that improves, and then go from there. Um. You know, if there were just a few things that you wanted your voters to keep in mind, um, why they should consider you, what makes you unique than um, others, what would you tell them? That I, I mean, check my, check my record, check my, you know, my accomplishments. Just, just check me out. They, they, I, I don't like to brag on myself, but it's, it's all out there. Um, I care about Atlantic City, like I said. I have been involved with Atlantic City and my residence and all different kinds of things for ever since I was like 19, like I said, so and I'm 52 now. So all my life, I've been uh, fighting for the right and, and, and the right thing for Atlantic City. Uh, so, you know, Atlantic City is a melting pot of, of various age groups. Um, you know, how do you plan to bridge the gap um, or how do you plan to effectively communicate with um, uh, the more seasoned, um, folks that you have around you, as well as the younger folks, as well. But see, that's 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 what makes it really good on my part because I communicate with them all, the younger ones, the older ones, in between. Um, as we know, Second Ward is um, starting to change with a lot of Hispanic in our wards now, and we just come to be a big melting pot now. And I I communicate with them all, so I, I always go to them, ask them ideas, and and, and how how they can help me fix what they might feel as is broken. So finally, you talked a lot about communication um, and how important that was. Um, you know, some residents feel that they don't really have access to city council. You know, they do, but you know, will their voice really be heard? Um, what's your way of being unique and capturing all of the concerns of people that requires you to do something other than sitting within uh, the city council building, um, but that would require you to go out and talk to people and, and hold events? What specifically are you thinking of? Oh, that's the way that I can get communication um, from my neighbors. One thing I have, my, my cell phone number has been the same for over 21 years. It's been out there for over 21 years. Um, my phone is always open for anyone to call. And that's the reason why I haven't ever changed my phone number. So when somebody needs to reach out to me, they know that number is still the same. That's perfect. Thank you. So we have one minute for closing remarks. Anything you'd like to add? Please do. Thank you. Well, I just think that, like I said, that Atlantic City needs better leadership. <clears throat> um, like I said, we do have some um, council people that's on there, and I think that's doing a wonderful job. Um, and they just need some help. They just need some help. Um, my record speaks for itself. Hello? We're here. Okay, my record speaks for itself, and I want to just do the best I can do for the city of Atlantic City. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much, dear. Y'all have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.
Good evening, everyone. We hope that you had a moment to look at uh, the uh, bio for Tom Porkin, who is running for mayor of Atlantic City. Um, Tom Porkin, uh, you have two minutes for opening remarks. We can see you, Tom, but we can't hear you. Not yet. <laughs> Tom, are you on mute? Um, I'm going to suggest that you use the call-in number. So you can use the call-in number and then we can see you on the video and then you can speak through the phone. Will that work? Can you hear me? I'm gonna just ask that everyone hang tight while we uh, work through some technical difficulties. Hey, Tom, can you hear me? 
No, not yet. Yes, please call in. Okay, Tom, try to see if you can unmute yourself. Okay. Perfect. Now you can hear me, that's outstanding. Absolutely. So this is what <laughs> happens. Sometimes you have technical difficulties, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep moving along, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Great. I think that that's what happens. A lot of us teachers are teaching remotely and we've run into various technical difficulties with Zoom yeah. and some of the other devices. So sorry to hold you up. Nope, that is okay. We're glad you're with us. Um, do you have opening remarks that you'd like to give us? If you'd like to take two minutes for that, uh, now is your time. Sure. Uh, my name is Tom Fork and I'm running for mayor of Atlantic City here. I live in the inlet section uh, with my family here in uh, Bungalow Park. Um, I'm a former city solicitor and police legal advisor for the city of Atlantic City. Um, a former uh, alcohol beverage control chairman uh, former arts commissioner, I, um, an educator here in the city, a teacher of, uh, you know, 10 years now um, in various districts in the area. Um, also, I, I briefly served as a pro bono counsel for the AC and AACP uh, back when Pierre Hollingsworth and uh, Speedy Marsh were involved. And uh, recently, 
uh, we've developed a, well, I say recently, uh, three years ago, we developed a civil rights suit against the state of New Jersey um, to actually sue the state in federal court on constitutional and civil rights violations involving the pilot program and S11. And that's something that, you know, we're still pursuing. Unfortunately, COVID has kind of delayed that. But, you know, I think I have the, the experience to help our city get back on terra firma, if you will. And that's really my goal is really to, to debate the issues and, and help our community grow and prosper uh, post, post pandemic. So we do have a few questions for you. Uh, the first one being the current mayor, Marty Small Sr. recently announced a tax decrease. What is your comments regarding the decrease? Um, and do you have uh, your own tax plan? Well, I, regarding the tax decrease, I think it's admirable that he's trying to do that and the money may appear to be available presently, but right now the state of New Jersey following S11 has placed our city in a $500 million debt. So we have a debt of $500 million. So in, in less than until that gets resolved, you know, I don't see how we can have a property tax decrease. That's only temporary. It, it, uh, it's my position, it may be just politics, but more problematic than the debt right now is the pilot because the pilot permits, uh, and this is uh, the Mazio and Armado, Sweeney and Norcross pilot that they, that they set upon us that, they, that the casinos will actually pay less taxes um, substantially less, tens of millions of dollars less once they report their losses post COVID. That's problematic because what that does is when they pay less, we as residents pay more. We already have, you know, senior citizens getting taxed out of their home that are on fixed incomes. Um, it's heartbreaking. And that's, you know, frankly, where the civil rights aspect of my lawsuit comes into play because that has a prejudicial effect upon our community. While it may not have the uh, prejudicial intent, it's certainly the effect because the vast majority of our residents, many of whom are being taxed out of their homes, uh, many of whom are African American, are, are experiencing that tax bite uh, from the pilot program, which has really turned out to be quite a train wreck for our community. So police accountability is a hot topic. Do you have a plan to address this? If so, please outline your plan. Well, I'm a police legal advisor for Mayor Whalen. And when I came down here, I moved back from Villanova. I've spent most of my adult life here, but when I served as police legal advisor, uh, Mayor Whalen instructed me to have a zero tolerance policy for the police department with anybody, zero tolerance for anybody that uh, exhibited any uh, discriminatory behavior. Um, and I rewrote the police rules and regulations at that time, which was 1998. It was the year my son was born. That's how I kind of remember the date. But um, we had a zero pol uh, tolerance policy. As a result, we terminated multiple officers for infractions. And, and that was under the Whalen administration. I remember several trials that we had because they tried to say that we couldn't do that. Um, I believe we have some of the paper clippings posted up on uh, our Facebook page, Forkin for AC. Um, but, you know, I would just simply enforce the rules and regulations we have already on the books. I mean, unless that's been rewritten, you know, since I was a police legal advisor, you know, we haven't, I believe we have an outstanding police department. Um, you know, police departments, how they run are, each municipality has different police rules and regulations consistent with their attorney general guidelines. And the local city solicitor has to make sure that those rules and regulations are enforced through the police legal department. So, you know, my, I would also implement a zero uh, tolerance policy for any officer that represented or exhibited any, um, any at all uh, racial discriminatory practices. I mean, that, that has to be across the country. And I think that, you know, the tragic events that happened in Minneapolis um, you know, or, or completely, you know, unacceptable on, on a variety of levels. And I think that, you know, that should be an eye opener for many municipalities whose solicitors 
basically sit on their hands and do nothing while, while things like this occur. And, and we have to be proactive. The state remains involved in Atlantic City. As mayor, how would you interact with the state? Well, how am I going to interact with the state? I want to sue them. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not a fan of the state of New Jersey. I believe that the pilot's unconstitutional. Um, I believe that uh, the constitutionality of S-11, the takeover, them running us into a debt of $500 million, uh, making our taxes unsustainable. Uh, across the board, the state of New Jersey is fiscally, they, they called um, former Mayor Langford's administration fiscally irresponsible. And that was at $100 million on debt that they incurred through the DCA, which approved our previous budgets. So here we are, um, we're, we're now three years into the state takeover and they've cranked up our debt to $500 million. I mean, just look at the numbers. It's uh, the state is not our friend. You know, they take from our residents, they take from our children in our public schools, and it, it has to stop. Thank you. And finally, you have less than a minute left. If you'd just like to give some closing remarks, um, you know, what's the takeaway for you? Well, I mean, the takeaway for me, you know, I've run for office in the past. Um, I think it's about getting the issues out there and to vet the issues. Uh, so the public can can understand them. I'm an educator by trade. So, you know, I want to teach our residents what the issues are and the remedies, whether I'm running for office or not. Um, I think that that's important that we continue to protect the process. And the only way to protect the process is to participate in it. So that's important. I think we need to, you know, still after all of this come together as a community and, and continue to move forward and rebuild. Great, thank you. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Of course, thank you for being here. Take care, bye bye. Good evening, everyone who is with us. Uh, we do have to stick to a uh, tight timeline. So we are going to ask uh, Mr. Tom Forkin to come back at the end um, of tonight to see if he has any final remarks or he wants to give to finish out his time. Um, we hope that you've had a, a moment to review uh, the bio uh, for Ms. Kamala Thomas Fields. Uh, Ms. Fields, I uh, would love to give you two minutes uh, to give your opening remarks. Am I on? I'm sorry, I don't see my face. Is that? So maybe your video me. is not on, but we can hear you. Uh, but just, just, just a moment, please. Okay. Wonderful. There I am. It looks like you're back out again. Are you able to hear me as well? Yes, we can hear you and see Fantastic, you. fantastic. Uh, good evening. And um, I am so excited about having the opportunity this evening to speak with the NAACP members and your viewers. It is an honor to have the opportunity to be the first woman um, African American woman getting this far in the city of Atlantic City running for mayor. As a mother, an educator, community leader, um, and someone who loves the city of Atlantic City, and for a very long time um, have been giving um, my heart and soul to the community, I hope that uh, I will have the opportunity to um, 
the, the mayor of the city, there are concerns um, that even walking day by day in the communities that I'm hearing the voices of folks and um, they want to see change. They want to have opportunities. They want to see clean and safe. And I hope um, if we are victorious July 7th, that we can move the agenda forward, my team and I, and provide that life and a better life for the citizens of Atlantic City. And I do indeed appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone this evening. Thank you so much. So the first question is, the current mayor, Marty Small Sr., recently announced a tax decrease. What is your comment regarding the decrease? Well, um, if your viewers have been watching lately and reading lately, um, I believe that it's impossible at this time to have our taxes lowered. Although it's um, probably very optimistic, and I'm not really too sure where he's getting his data from, but if you read the newspaper where you see the casinos have already considered being bailed out and they probably will get it from the state, um, that is not going to be a benefit for our city. Um, we see that they already are talking about putting our supermarket on pause. And um, it was a priority and agenda that we've been waiting for. It, it just, the life of me, I don't even believe why we haven't had a supermarket in the city of Atlantic City, and we should. So um, realistically, I don't believe that. Unfortunately, I differ with the mayor and saying that he will be able to lower taxes. Again, um, I'm doing research, I'm talking to experts and the folks that I speak to that know very well about the tax situation with the city of Atlantic City say it's impossible for that to occur. And um, although it may be political propaganda, we cannot mislead the voters or the people that live here. Uh, so then with that, with the research and the experts that you've been consulting in your team, what would be your tax plan then? Well, again, um, we have to be realistic. I'm hearing that right now, the city basically is bankrupt and it's been bankrupt for a long time. Although the state has tried to make an initiative and they unfortunately in my opinion have somewhat taken us backwards um, we are in a financial crisis and it's nothing that people can deny uh, we would have to take probably a look at what is currently existing next to none and again bankruptcy is probably some of the things that may have to happen whether we want to face it or not the pilot is not going to be our way out because of the pandemic, as we all know, we're gonna get less of the monies in years to come. And uh, we, with the state being here and the pilot program, still have to pay our bond and own and big folks that we have to pay our bills to. The most important thing is that we recognize that it's probably gonna take a two year um, realistic restructuring and the possibilities of, like I said, uh, we are dead broke and looking at restructuring our debt, possibly looking at ways to recover what we can, if so, um, and stop thinking that we have to rely on uh, outside special interests to make determination. We have the possibility in this city to have diversify our economy, partnership, grant writing, have the best and the brightest around us on our team and in City Hall. And it's my objective when I become mayor to have just that. I will have the best people around me with transparency and also professionalism to turn the city around. Thank you. Police accountability is a hot topic. Do you have a plan to address this? If so, please outline your plan. There is no secret. Um, the police department has had issues over the years. And I do believe that. Um, that's a top priority for major cities and all cities in the world right now, with brutality being an issue, um, lack of minorities on departments, um, having, unfortunately, you know, looking at the police department and seeing whether it is structured properly. It has to have supervision, and um, those are things that we have to consider. I believe that we should have community policing 
and it should never have gone away. That's a plan that we can look to bring back. I believe that we should have uh, civilian re review boards and that's something that we consider or should consider moving forward. And I also believe that we should have possibly a police commissioner to take politics out of it and relationships. Uh, you can't have uh, friendships and kinships with people that are in authority and running departments. You need to have a professional, well-managed, well-maintained, well-supervised organization, group, and culture that is the fabric of your community and that is very sensitive about the needs. I was able to um, have the opportunity to go to the um, the protest and there were young men there that were yelling out that they had been impacted by police brutality in the city and that hurts my heart that is overlooked and I know people that have put in complaints with our um, current department and internal um, um, affairs and there's no reply and again there's no transparency and they have lack of faith within our police system and what is happening. I was walking in the streets yesterday, going door to door in the sixth ward, and a woman told me there were several times she calls for um, noise and disturbance in her area, and the police don't even show up. So they can no longer say that um, the casinos are an issue of policing because the casinos are closed and the businesses are closed. We should have safety and security more so than ever. And we saw that uh, young people in our community just a couple weeks ago, um, unfortunately, there was violence. And so the plan would be to start implementing uh, a greater ability of um, oversight, um, new additional potential people to be involved in the policing of the department and bringing back community policing and creating uh, a civilian, police civilian board uh, throughout the city itself. Thank you. The state remains involved in Atlantic City. As mayor, how would you interact with the state? Well, again, um, I have done uh, many researches on this topic. And because I was concerned when it arrived here, like Newark and Camden, the state being there, you really have your hands tied with making a decision. I do believe that the transition period is supposed to be two years for them to um, eventually leave our city. And um, it is my goal from day one to start uh, working on ways to transition them um, and become independent again as a city. We have to be realistic. It's not about the relationships of the state. It is about that they have a job to do, and I respect that. But I also know that there is talent here of people that live in the city and there's talent of people that have always won an opportunity right here in this town. And we should consider the talent that we have and start looking at ways to implement um, people getting in government and be able to have the chances of also governing this beautiful town. Uh, the state, unfortunately, again, um, I'm just not um, a fan of what I've seen. The Jim Johnson plan, it was somewhat of a, of a good reading and it talked about the possibilities. But now post COVID, it's kind of, you know, came and gone. We have to look at what's going to happen in this newness in society. And we're going to have to have people to start looking at making plans and implementing plans. Uh, the plan that I have along with um, my team and I, is healthy, wealthy, and wise. And one of the things that we're looking at is making sure that we can have realistic and tangible things from day one. The city has a homelessness problem. We can't avoid that. It is existing. And it has um, a, a lot of issues with mental illness. And the state has not addressed that. So though they are here, and I understand that the effort may have been well. We still have many issues that exist by them being here that have been overlooked and not achievable goals to help people to be empowered, 
to want to stay in this town. So many people have left. And um, that's a concern because people shouldn't want to leave Atlantic City. It's a beautiful, thriving, potentially city. If you have the right leadership, you have bold leadership, you have people that are working together collectively and um, are fine with uh, um, disagreeing at times and not always having the answers and are very clear on that. But you have the potential of folks around you that can help get the answers, solve the solutions, make sure that the town is growing and developing all of us together. It has nothing to do with just the mayor. The mayor works for the citizens and they should listen to the voices of the people. They should have the right people around them do the job because the people are relying on you. Take pride in your city and make sure that every generation uh, that comes behind you, that you prepare our young people. Don't forget our seniors and also be proud of the cultures and the diversity that we have in this town that will implement a better life and a better lifestyle for all of us. And I do believe that, and I believe that I can be the right person to do that job at the right time moving forward. The next question is, how can Atlantic City become cleaner? What is your plan? It's a little bit of a broad question, so I will, I'll narrow it um, in two ways. Aesthetically cleaner um, and clean air. What would be your plan for those two areas? So um, one of the things that happened in the city, which um, I uh, hope at some point we can go back to having, we don't need a tale of two cities. Um, when the tourism district um, was implemented in the city and it divided the city and it was very disheartening. So the cleaning part of it would definitely be from um, the first ward up into the sixth ward and you have to have an overview of um, a needs assessment of looking at the blight. I don't think that we should say the boardwalk um, is any different than the streets and the neighborhoods or the avenue. There was a time where you did see more of um, street cleaning and then that was taken away when the tourism district came in and divided the city. And that's not fair to the residents that pay the taxes and are looking for cleanliness and are looking for um, the services. If they are paying taxes, they should have good services. And so we need to rethink that. I believe that that should go away. I think we should have a citywide plan that covers all areas of the city, all walks of the city, all different areas collectively on a daily basis. And it can be structured when you have a team of people that are experts in the area and are willing to work with your stakeholders. Um, regarding the air control, um, there is no question that um, when we move into this age of uh, the next life for all of us, um, the windmills are definitely a bonus. Um, and I believe in uh, definitely clean air. I definitely believe in um, solar. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we could do to um, have preventive measures and also quality of air. And um, one of the things that we also have to understand that it is about, you know, partnering, grant writing, and implementing. Thank you. That's perfect. So we have uh, about one minute left. Uh, what are your closing remarks? Well, there's one thing that I want to bring to everyone's attention, and I, um, I was honestly not going to attend this evening because I felt, um, that it should not have been um, a forum where unfortunately the president of the organization endorsed um, my opponent. I think that in the future uh, there should be a way where it's fair for everyone. Um, I kind of felt that you know it's very difficult for myself to really um, know what I'm walking into when the president of the organization endorsed my opponent. So one of the suggestions that I have moving forward that perhaps that may be, I mean, everyone has the right, um, it's freedom of speech to be able to um, endorse who you want to, but I think that should be done after um, the forums and discussions so people could have a clear mind and a, a, a understanding and a clear understanding 
that it is for the members of the NAACP and for the people that live in the community to not have a bias or, um, you know, an uncomfortable situation. It was uncomfortable, but I know that the citizens need to hear me and folks need to get to know who I am. And um, tomorrow evening, I'm having a town hall meeting uh, for Pamela for uh, AC2020 at gmail.com. And I will continue to talk about the issues and I will continue to work hard every day. And I hope that folks have an opportunity to view our town hall and ask questions and well um, in a more organic and free way uh, because I do think that the citizens are deserving of that. And thank you again for the opportunity and have a wonderful evening. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us tonight. Have a nice thank night. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too. Good evening, everyone. We have with us uh, James Whitefield, uh, who is also running for mayor of Atlantic City. Uh, we would love to give you two minutes for your opening remarks. It looks like you're on mute. You can just unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Okay, now unmute yourself. Unmute yourself on the, there you go, perfect. Okay. We hear you. Oh, well, good evening, Councillor Melville and uh, Mr. Bibb in Atlantic City. Good evening. I am Jimmy Whitehead and I am the third candidate in this fabulous Change Atlantic City mayoral race. Um, I, I was actually born in Washington, D.C., and I spent most of my life in D.C. growing up, going to high school there. I went into the United States Navy uh, at the age of 18. I came out the Navy, and I worked for on Capitol Hill for many years uh, for Jack Kemp and Frank Garini and a number of other congressional members. Um, then I went to work for the White House for 12 years. Um, that was quite a extraordinary experience uh, working for President Reagan and President Bush at that time. And then I became a Democrat 20 years ago, a proudly becoming a Democrat because I saw the way that the Dem Republican Party was going and it wasn't going in the direction that I could be a part of in the future. And so for the last 20 years, I've been in Atlantic City, um, meeting people in Atlantic City and thinking about ideas that can make Atlantic City better. And the whole time I've been here thinking about that, I keep seeing Atlantic City uh, declining uh, with the, the casinos closing, with the uh, unemployment rate going up, with the unethical uh, political activities that go on in every election, unfortunately. Um, I said, you know, it's got to be a better way. And so I chose to get more engaged and I ran Charles Garrett's campaign uh, the first time, uh, got involved uh, when he ran for mayor. And then the last election, I ran for mayor and I ran on a platform of creating cybersecurity jobs in Atlantic City and doing some um, re rejuvenation of our youth programs and recreation centers and workforce of the future education. So I am back again uh, running for mayor with the intentions to win and to bring Atlantic City back to greatness and to give everybody in Atlantic City a mayor they can be very proud of every day they wake up. So that's why I'm Jimmy Whitehead. I'm a nice guy. Uh, I love everybody. And I'm ready to dig into some of these questions that uh, Councilor Melville wants to ask. Great, so um, let's dig into it. The current mayor, Marty Small Sr., recently announced a tax decrease. Mm -hmm. What is your comment regarding the decrease? 
Well, you know, this is the political, this is a political campaign. So a lot of people come up with a lot of ideas that are very superficial on the front of it. And uh, we know that Atlantic City homeowners need a lot more than a 5% make-believe tax cut to try to help us recover, uh, particularly coming out of this COVID-19, when the whole nation is on the verge of bankruptcy. We, Atlantic City, can be one city that comes up with some real ideas that are not just make-believe tax cuts for the citizens during a time of a political campaign, which are not real numbers. So I, that's the main thing. I don't think it was real. I think it was very politically um, expedient for him to use his time to say something about a tax cut that isn't real. So to answer your question, uh, I thought it was very superficial. So given your opinion on that, what is your tax plan um, if uh, given the position and the opportunity to be mayor of Atlantic City? Sure. Well, first of all, to, make, to, to get more tax revenue, we have to expand the tax base. And the way we expand the tax base is by creating more jobs, number one, and well-paying jobs, not casino jobs, but good paying jobs, dealing with infrastructure, uh, revitalization, and creating a new industry up here with the Department of Defense, the FBI, uh, NSA, the CIA, um, Google, Amazon, they can come to Atlantic City because they need cybersecurity workforce training, uh, trained employees. Right now, America needs 2 million cyber warriors trained. Now, if Atlantic City beats everybody to the, to the race and we create 10,000 of them right here, right now, then as they say, the man or woman who builds a better mousetrap, the world would be a pathway to your doorstep. So I'm saying Atlantic City, let's be the first in America to create America's first cyber triangle and let's beat everybody else to, the, to the, uh, create this pathway for new growth and also to deal with the tax structure being a, um, easing it on the homeowners. I propose that for the last five years, there's been this pilot that the state has benefited from. Nobody in Atlantic City has benefited from this so-called pilot program. I say, let's do a people's pilot program and let's, let's try to let's test legalization of recreation marijuana for four years. And for the four years as a people pilot, I would like Governor Phil Murphy to let all 100% of that revenue stay right here in Atlantic City, like they're doing in Colorado. And during that period of time, 50% of that revenue will cover the cost of running the government. 12.5% of that revenue can go to uh, the police department. 12.5% of that revenue can go to uh, education. And 25% can go to a new fund to help people with prevent evictions and foreclosures that are going to be coming very hard and heavy after COVID because people have been paid. So there's going to be a lot of evictions out there. So we need to come up with some creative revenue streams that can help save Atlantic City. And I think if we do a test pilot with a recreational cannabis and let all that revenue stay right here in Atlantic City, don't let it go nowhere else, uh, Governor Phil Murphy, then I think we could be on the verge of a real tax benefit and offer homeowners zero property taxes for four years. That's a real tax benefit. Thank you, Mr. Whitehead. Um, I've been asked by uh, the team to introduce myself to you. I think you're looking for Yolanda. She's doing the incredible work behind the scenes. You're Sierra, Sierra. Yes, sir. I'm Sierra. Sierra. Yes, sir. Um, involved with the NAACP and a local attorney. But it's yes, very Sierra. nice to meet you. It's very nice to have this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. Police accountability is a hot topic. Do you have mm -hmm. a plan to address this? If so, please outline your plan. Sure. Well, you know what? First of all, I'm going to say this. Uh, I'm a former Navy man. I'm a military guy. And I know that there are more good police officers than there are bad ones. But the ones that are bad are horrible because they're killing people. They're killing black men by putting their knees in their neck and shooting them in their back. So I want to say, first of all, Atlantic City, we do have a pretty good police department. You have good community relations here and there. We need some things to be worked on. Uh, I think that we need to change some of the folks to the top uh, and get some of the nepotism out of the party, out of the um, police department. But I think that we should have a working relationship with the police department because we're not going to resolve the problems of any police department by pointing fingers and not talking to each other. We have to establish some communication with each other because at the end of the day, the same police officers that people are complaining about, 
when somebody comes and robs your house, they're going to be the first ones you call when you dial 911. So there has to be a real balance in terms of how much we appreciate our police officers and how much we penalize the police officers that are doing the wrong stuff. We need to lock them up with murderers. If they murder somebody, if they murder a black person or murder a white person, they need to be locked up. But the rest of the police officers, officers just like our US Armed Forces, that protect our borders every day, we need to be appreciative of the good folks. So we're switching topics a little bit here. The state remains involved in Atlantic City. As mayor, how would you interact with the state? Well, I know Governor Murphy and his wonderful First Lady Tammy Murphy just in a friendly relationship. And I think that the one thing that the governor's office will respect if we have a mayor that has the utmost integrity. And integrity means that you have to have, um, integrity means that you have to have honor. It means that you cannot be threatening people. You can't be bullying people. It means that you have to have leadership and you have to be able to bring something to the table. Now, when I'm the mayor and I bring $5 billion of private investment to the table, well, I'm bringing more money than the state has right now, okay? And this is private investment. So when Governor Murphy sees that Jimmy Whitehead is leading with integrity, he's leading with maturity, he's leading with some knowledge of how to run a city better, plus Jimmy Whitehead brought $5 billion to the table, I think Governor Murphy will say, Jimmy, let's sit down and talk about this. How can we make this work better? Well, Governor, the first thing we need you to do is give the power of the people back to the power of Atlantic City. That would be the first thing, Governor. Once we do that, then let's sit down and figure out how we become the most thriving, most resilient, uh, most safest, cleanest city in America, because it can be done. And we're the only country, the only city in America that has this 10,000 cybersecurity jobs being developed under a very integrity-driven leadership to bring Atlantic City back. How can Atlantic City become cleaner? What is your plan? It's a broad question, so I'm going to uh, narrow it to aesthetically cleaner and uh, as far as clean air as, is concerned. Yes, well, I would say the first thing that we need to do to clean Atlantic City up and to clean the air in Atlantic City is go to your ballot and color in column D for Jimmy Whitehead. The first thing that's going to start cleaning up Atlantic City is by having Jimmy Whitehead as the mayor, because I'm going to walk the streets with the workers to find the places that need to be clean, like I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. I mean, you go just walk around the city and you can see the filth. So it doesn't take a brain, a uh, rocket scientist to figure out how to clean up Atlantic City. The mayor needs to get in the trenches with the public works folks. The other thing is public works. They only got about 10 people working there and these guys are not being paid enough. And they're telling me that they've been driven like slaves. Well, we need to be able to bring some revenue in from the private sector, some revenue in from selling recreational marijuana, and let's get about 10 or 20 more public work workers over there, and let's pay them a decent wage. These guys are being paid slave wages right now. And I know we can do better than that. So I would clean the streets up with public works. I would bring in private sector investment. And then on the environmental part, we could partner with Smithsonian Institute. We could partner with the Rockefeller Foundation. We could partner with private sector organizations to help us do things to clean the, keep the water clean, to examine uh, solar energy projects further, to look at some of these wind projects. But we can be creative and not use taxpayers' dollars to accomplish some of this stuff. Public safety is a concern for many residents. Do you have a public safety plan? If so, what is it? Yeah, well, my public safety plan that I've been talking to somebody about, if we're going to be the safest city in America, we're going to have to incorporate some more artificial intelligence, some security drones. We need to go to this new world order that has happened now. You know, since 9-11 and since this COVID, there's going to be a different world when we come out of this thing. And for us to be safe, the safest city in America, we need to have revenue. Again, you got to have money. We have to stay focused on bringing some money into the city that's not taxpayers' dollars. Then we work with some of these big security companies that are interested in cyber. Let's put some drones out there. Let's put a camera on every corner. Let's connect the city up like it's run by the government. And let's do whatever we have to do to make the city safer. But I think working with the police department, artificial intelligence, and a lot of the new um, internet of things stuff that's out there, we can collaborate and not only make the city safer, but train people 
for the new jobs that it's going to take to make the city safer. What is your plan to have Atlantic City leave state oversight? To get out of the uh, state oversight? Yes. Well, I, like I think I was kind of answering that earlier when I said when we have $5 billion of private sector money here, we bring something to the table and we bring some integrity to the table. I think we could uh, offer the uh, governor a choice he can't refuse. Okay. Education in Atlantic City uh, with our students, is there room for improvement? Do you like where it is? What are your concerns um, with education? Yes, there's so much room for improvement here in Atlantic City, even though you have a very good teachers here, you have people who care about our students deeply, but our schools have not been invested in. Atlantic schools need more investment for more what they call workforce, uh, future workforce education, future workforce training. And that means we start taking out the young people who are in like eight to 12 years old, we start introducing them to more robotics and more um, um, technology programs in school. And then when they get from 13 up to the 12th grade, we actually engage them with internship programs that would be federal government programs here or there. But we have to introduce our students to not only the new technology that's gonna be running the world, but we also have to introduce our students to compassionate capitalism. We have to teach our children that money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. So we have to teach our children to grow economically as well as we do academically. Because I was just out there walking in Stanley Holmes Village today, and I was meeting with some little kids. They must have been about eight, nine years old. And I asked them, I said, do you want to make a lot of money when you grow up? They said, yes. I said, what do you want to be? They said they want to be a lawyer. They want to be a police officer. They want to be a doctor. That's what we have to focus on. So, Mr. Whitehead, you have a little less than a minute left uh, mm -hmm. of your closing remarks. Anything you'd like to leave us with? Yes, this is what I'm going to tell you, Atlantic City. You have an opportunity to change the paradigm of Atlantic City economically, in terms of security, in terms of education. You have a candidate here that is not owned by local law firms. I'm not owned by the casinos. I'm not owned by the unions. I am owned by the voters. I'm the only candidate that has an economic plan, which is right behind me. I have access to capital. I know how to create private sector jobs. And I know how to run this city better than it's being run now because it's not being run at all by the, the people of Atlantic City. Give me the opportunity, vote for column D this time around. Give me the chance. And if, it doesn't, if you don't like it, I'll be on one year probation because there's another election in one year but I will turn this city around in 12 months, but you gotta give me the opportunity, get your ballots, vote for column D, vote for Jimmy Whitehead, security, economics, and education will lead the future for Atlantic City in the most prosperous way. Thank you very much for your time and have a nice night. Thank you too, Counselor. God bless you. God bless. Now we'll listen to the next one. <laughs> Let's see, so what's going on now? I think we're gonna exit. Good evening, everyone. We hope that you've all had a chance to uh, review uh, Mayor Marty Small's bio. Uh, we have Mayor Small on with us now. Um, Mayor Small, you have two minutes to give us your opening remarks. Yes, uh, good evening, 
and it's a great day here in the city of Atlantic City. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Mayor Marty Small Senior. I was born and raised here in the great city of Atlantic City. I like to say I'm Atlantic City born, Atlantic City bred. And when I die, I'll be Atlantic City dead. Proud product of the public school systems here in Atlantic City. Uh, graduated of Richard Stockton College, Stockton University with a, a communications degree, a bachelor, bachelor of arts, a master's degree from Cheney University in educational leadership. And some of my experiences outside of politics as a social caseworker in the city of Atlantic City's welfare department, the former safe haven program coordinator, former unit director of the Boys and Girls Club of Atlantic City, ran the Atlantic City Public Schools after school program for 11 years. And lastly, um, the Dean of Athletics, Recreation and Governmental Affairs of Principal Academy Charter. Um, politically, I got my start on a, a library board. Then I went to the Atlantic City Board of Education. I served as vice president during my term. In 2004, I was sworn in as the youngest elected council member in the city's history. 2016, the city council president. And on October 3rd, I became the mayor of the great city of Atlantic City. Obviously, I worked my way up. I didn't just come out of nowhere and ask people to vote for me for mayor. I've demonstrated my ability on all levels of government. For the past eight, eight months, I came in under a crisis. We stabilized the government. We changed the climate and culture in City Hall. And more importantly, we came in with the plan. And we are executing that plan. It's not enough time to get into the plan, but you can go to www.martysmall, the number four mayor, and see our detailed, robust 41 page plan for the great city of Atlantic City. I came in not only under that crisis, but I had to deal with the change of government crisis. We dealt with that. I had to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. We dealt with that and recently uh, the riots. So they say, you know your true leader's character during the test of time and crisis. And it goes in my life quote by the late great Dr. Martin Luther King, which is the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands at moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and kind controversy. And these are challenging and controversial times, and there's no time to change leadership in the middle of the crisis. And that's why I'm the most experienced, qualified, and accomplished candidate of all the three. When you say the name Marty Small, for whatever reason, you don't have to say who, like my male opponent and my female opponent. You recently announced a tax decrease. Are there any additional comments you'd like to give on that? Um, what do you have to say about that? Yes, um, the numbers are the numbers. And let me just give you my history on the city side. Men, women, political opportunists lie, but the numbers don't. During my five years leading the city's finances, I produced three flat budgets on the city side and two tax decreases. I challenge anyone to come up with that record my opponents are talking very irresponsible, such as using terms like bankruptcy and the city's tax decrease is impossible. Not only is it a decrease on the city side, it's a 5.65% decrease, 5.65 cent decrease overall when all taxing agencies are done. They, they say irresponsible things like debt. Debt is a yearly payment. Yes, the city is in $566 million in debt. If we do nothing and the sky doesn't fall just by the debt payment the city will be out of debt in 2040 uh, 2043 so that comes from not knowing how municipal financing work they can talk to any expert they want i'm so proud of our financial team and the things that we've done here in the city of atlantic city in election year or election time or not as a citizen of atlantic city which i question if one is really a citizen you should be happy no matter who lowers your taxes. But to say that it's disingenuous that we're using this as an election stunt is a smack in the face to the Lieutenant Governor who approved this budget. We worked extremely hard understanding, even during the pandemic, that we delivered for the good people of Atlantic City. So now's the time to talk about your tax plan going forward. What would that look like? Well, listen, my tax plan is to get as much revenue here in the city of Atlantic City without using taxpayers' money. And one of those things uh, happened today. It'll be a press release out tomorrow. We receive funding for the first bridge in Venice Park, which is the Ohio Avenue Bridge. And we just announcing that we're receiving $1 million to help out uh, with funding in the second bridge in Venice Park. We had $19.6 million in resiliency fund. That's gonna go to Lower Chelsea, 
that's going to go to other areas to help out with uh, resiliency uh, during this time. So under my administration, we had over $30 million in grant projects, including the whole repayment of Atlantic Avenue. And you say, what is the plan? The plan is to bring more ratables. That's how you do it. It's not about jobs. It's about ratables. We need to bring the middle class back here to the city of Atlantic City. We need to offer things that attract the middle class. I'm working with Creta to bring back the program that was highly successful with the police and fire and to expand it to school teachers, principals, guidance counselors, Atlantic care workers, Stockton professors. So that way we can build up the rateable base by offering um, incentives to live here in town to professionals so we can really grow the economy. That's the only way that the economy is going to grow. We can control the part that spending is down in City Hall. And once again, the numbers don't lie. People are playing politics at this time. It's not safe. Just look at my record. Over the last five years, again, three flat budgets and two tax decreases for the great people of Atlantic City. And listen, we have a long way to go. We're going to lean on our partners. Um, we got a lot of money that didn't cost a lot of money from the uh, pandemic through the CARES Fund, uh, through my meeting with Cory Booker. And Atlantic City was the only city in Atlantic County to receive such funds. So we're going to continue to lean on our partners at every step, at every level of government. We need that now more than ever. But we've always been fiscally responsible. The numbers don't lie. And we're going to continue to be fiscally responsible. When you talk about rateables, we are going to announce a project. We already announced it, but it's on hold with COVID that luxury housing will come to the Marina District behind Golden Nugget with a joint project with Borai Development and uh, MGM. So we're excited about that. We were ready to announce a major housing project uh, on the beachfront with uh, CRDA. But as you know, our world changed uh, March 12th. So we have always been proactive. We've always been aggressive. And I've always shown that I would put my neck on the line to do anything for the taxpayers such when the controversial measure was uh, passed to bond the pension and health benefits. A lot of people didn't like it. But guess what? We saved the Atlantic City residents' taxes. Thank you. Police accountability is a hot topic. Do you have a plan to address this? If so, please outline the plan. Well, when I came into the office, I came in under uh, a leadership theme. It's an acronym-based theme, and it's called Let's Ace It. Leaders, LET stands for leadership, expectations, transparency, and stability. ACE stands for accountability, credibility, and excellence in execution. And I'm glad that you said accountability. When the chief and I sat down, when I first became mayor and I went over my vision for the police department, it was accountability. During my speech at the rally, I said, listen, our police department has been reformed under the leadership of Chief Henry White, along with the fine men and women in blue. The community relations have changed immensely. You can feel it through the community. No longer all along lines at the council meeting for the dog bites, all along lines at the council meeting for alleged police brutality. Listen, does every organization have bad people? Absolutely. And our job is to get the bad people out. And we were doing that. Um, we're going to have a progressive police department that focuses on clean and safe. As you saw with my first initiative when I became mayor prior to the pandemic, we really cleaned Atlantic Avenue up. And we're going to take that same energy and effort into all of our troubled neighborhoods, um, you know, once this uh, pandemic is over. The state remains involved in Atlantic City. As mayor, how would you interact with the state? Well, I'm just going to continue to be the professional that I was and let the record reflect. I was against the state takeover. I fought the toughest against the state takeover. But now that the state has been here, I don't agree with all the elements, but you can't say financially that it hasn't made a difference. It hasn't saved the taxpayers money. And people have to realize that um, you have to be a professional at the end of the day. And I worked hand in hand with Chris Christie's right hand man, Jeff Chiesa, when he was here. And now we under the direction of uh, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver and uh, Governor Murphy, you know, we're doing the same thing. It's important. And they are letting me run the city because they believe in my ability. They have uh, adopted my 41 page plan and the city is headed in the right direction. And it's important to not only have relationships with the state, but on a federal level as well. And we're going to continue to be responsible. We're going to continue to push our plan and push our agenda 
and let the good people of Atlantic City know and the state know that you have people here who are competent, who are educated, who are experienced, that can run the city. And the state takeover is scheduled to end in November 2021. Um, you know, we're ready for it to end. However, if the state remains, you know, we'll govern the same way. But the state will still have oversight as they had since 2010 because of the amount of money here in the city of Atlantic City. So I have a great working relationship with the state, which is key. You can't get anything done without it. And for people out there who think otherwise, they don't really understand government or how government works, and more importantly, how to get things done. So moving forward, what is your plan to get Atlantic City out of under the state control? Well, we're, we're, we're showing them now. We're showing them, number one, that we're fiscally responsible. You got a mayor who has relationships all across the board. You have a mayor with a robust plan with, uh, you know, the various departments that we want to do. We, we change the city hall. We change in the climate and culture. And you have to remember, I hear my opponent saying something about slave wages. First of all, that's an that's a irresponsible comment uh, at a time like this. I love the Public Works Department. I'm not just saying that because it's campaign time, but it was Council President Small who was in charge of revenue and finances that raised the wages from 22,000 minimum wages to 22,500. We've equipped our Public Works with the staff and needs. We equipped them with equipment. So not only are we um, talking to talk, we're walking the walk. So just our overall plan, a department by department breakdown of the city of Atlantic City and a plan for each department is showing the leadership at the state that we know what we're doing. You know, they say a leader knows the way, goes the way and shows the way. And I'm doing that for the great people of Atlantic City in my short eight months. And believe me, the best is yet to come Atlantic City and we will get through this together as we did everything else. So switching gears a little bit, the next question is this. How can Atlantic City become cleaner? What is your plan? And we're going to uh, specifically talk about um, aesthetically. And when we're talking clean air, what is your plan? Well, listen, um, obviously every city could be cleaner. Uh, we're working, uh, we're communicating with CRDA. Uh, Matt, Matt Darty has been the best executive director for Atlantic City. Um, our clean and safe agenda um, includes everything from code enforcement to the cleaning of the streets. One of my goals, we have an expanded recycling program at the city yard. When I came in, we have um, ward cleanup days twice a month in each ward with a dumpster. We've been extremely aggressive um, cleaning the streets, working with um, the special improvement district in a partnership because at the end of the day, there's no such thing as two cities. We have to work together. We have to keep pushing for the, for the taxpayers of Atlantic City because the money that they pay, they should have the cleanest. And um, I, we, we came out with our clean and safe agenda and we headed in the right direction. And a lot has to do with about to hire some seasonal people. Um, and a lot had to, the slowdown had to do with uh, COVID-19 because of the unknown. But at the same time, we equipped our workers with the necessary PPE equipment to get the job done. And I'm excited where we are. Can we get better? Yes. And then the clean air? Well, the clean air, um, you know, we believe in uh, green energy. Um, you know, we're, um, you know, dealing with uh, all the offshore wind companies. And, um, you know, we'll have a plan um, directed at that. But right now, we were focusing on our clean and safe um, community agenda, which includes two cleanup days per month per ward with a dumpster in every ward and it's getting rave reviews. And our response, you know, we can't see everything. Um, we interact with people. Our office is very aggressive. Any complaints that come to our attention, we jump on them right away. And that's all you can ask for from your leadership. Public safety is a concern for many residents. Do you have a public safety plan? If so, what is it? Well, yes, um, we talked about um, an aggressive uh, public safety plan that includes community-based policing. Um, I have experience in that when I was a safe haven program coordinator when Atlantic City was one of five cities to receive the community police partnership grant. I was the safe haven coordinator. We ran a summer camp for boys and girls called Precious Jewels in All Sports. And at the same time, we kept up with uh, um, the community police program. And that's the way that Atlantic City needs to get back where the community um, has an even better relationship with the police 
for an overall better, better community. We have less than a minute left. If you'd like to leave the viewers with some closing remarks, what would they be? Well, listen, Atlantic City, you know me. You don't have to say who. I've been in this community. I paid my dues every step of the way. It was a long journey, but I persevered and I got here. A lot of people question if I could ever do the job. I think those questions are gone. I love my city. I'm passionate. My two opponents, let's start with the female, said that she can't see changes in City Hall. I wouldn't see changes either if all I did was walk the halls, complain, and campaign. My other opponent, I like to call him the leap year candidate. He appears every four years, like February 29th. He came in 2013 to run for mayor, run a campaign for mayor. Didn't happen. Came in in 17. Am I still on? Oh, you're on. Yeah, okay. I saw the screen move. He came in in 2017. He promised 5,000 cybersecurity jobs, and we don't have one. Now he's coming in to say $5 billion. I question if he ever ran a budget for $5,000. And I even question, is he really a resident of Atlantic City? Who sent you? Atlantic City, you know me, whether you agree with my policies or not. I'm in this community. I, I put it on the line each and every day. Um, the female opponent says she's been in this community for 25 years, and people are still saying who. Never put it on the line. Never dealt with the main issues in the community. Never took a stand. One thing about me, I'm going to always take a stand. Atlantic City, remember, a small plan makes a big difference. And all you little kids out there, close your eyes. Dream big. Vote small. We are with your hopes. Mayor Small, thank you very much for your time and have a nice night. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, staying with us. We are moving on to uh, the Atlant Atlantic County Freeholder at Large. We have with us Celeste Fernandez. Um, if you'd like to give two minutes for your opening remarks, now would be the time. And if you could just unmute yourself. That's okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me tonight. My name is Celeste Fernandez, and one of the Democratic candidates for Alani County Freeholder at Large, and a community leader and a small business owner. I've been a resident of Alani County for over 20 years, and a mother of uh, three, I'm sorry, and a grandmother of five. For the past 20 years, I've been advocating for our community, advocating for our casinos, employees' rights, uh, human rights, our immigration system, and uh, for us to have equality in our communities. In 2018, I ran for the same position, freeholded at large, and almost unseat the chairman uh, of this county. He had 47,000 votes, I have 45,300. And uh, my plan was to win uh, and share the light and to bring the attention in that we cannot move forward in the county, in a diverse county, just talking about economic development when we have so many social issues that we have to uh, take into consideration. This is a diverse county. One solution don't fit all. We cannot uh, advance in the economy part when we are suffering in the social issues. And I'm referring to, we have a big problem with the uh, opioid crisis. And we don't have a system in place just to start with that one, per se. So I'm here running again, because like two years later, we have the same issues, maybe worse by this time. And I'm running to make Atlantic City a better place to live, to work, and enjoy for the residents of Atlantic County and for the next generation. Thank you. So the first question is this, 
The legislature has passed in December 2019 a bill which removes the prohibition on voting by persons convicted of indictable offenses who are on parole or probation. How would you spread this word um, to the community? How would you spread the, the words that you refer, I mean, like my opinion on that? How would you let the community know? That they are, that they have the right to vote? Yes, ma'am. At this moment? Yes. Whereas as the community leaders, the first thing that we do is go to those uh, nonprofit organizations and to other community leaders and organizations and have meetings with those uh, 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 entities of the societies of, of those uh, groups to let them know that now they have the opportunity to vote and exercise their rights. It's by, by community outreach that we uh, do this together. There is a bill that proposes constitutional amendment to legalize cannabis for personal non-medical use by adults who are aged 21 years or older. Do you have a position on this? Well, my position, I would like to see what the legislator come out with. But we have to understand there's a lot of color and brown and minority people incarcerated due to this type of uh, substances. So if we, we can go back to the era of the alcohol. I mean, it was the same thing. Once they legalized, then all these issues that was uh, with the alcohol, the liquor, uh, became like obsolete. And that what is happening right now with the uh, cannabis and per se the marijuana as well. But it's gonna help a lot uh, with economy and we're gonna and it's gonna help a lot with the discrimination with our colored people in the uh, justice uh, department. Do you think you would send a letter of support for this? And what would be the reasons um, identifying your reasons to support the law? And the first thing is like, like I mentioned before, yes. help the economy. I mean, and there's a lot of incarceration. There's a lot of people in jail right now for little things like that. And it's affecting our color people, our minority group, because of the systemic racism that exists in our uh, judicial system. It has been brought to the attention of the Atlantic County Freehold Board that other townships in New Jersey pay the postage on mail, mail-in ballots for each election. What is your position on funding to cover postage paid on ballots for the county? I mean, we are the county. We have to lead by example. And to make a better way for our residents to be able to vote, let's pay for the postage so that our residents don't have to go that extra step uh, and go and pay. I mean, we, we are able to fund it. We are a wealthy uh, county. Our residents don't have to go through that. I see now I would support it. What is your opinion on education in Atlantic City? Um, is there room for improvement? Do you like it the way it is? Um, what, if any, um, thing can you bring to education during your term? Well, we have, a, a, just for education per se, we have a bigger issue, uh, you know, in our community. I mean, we are number five right now as a segregated school. That means we don't have equal education. Again, we are a diverse county. What we, what we are fighting is still to, on 2020 for equality, for our residents to have a decent education, a good quality education, yes. It's no room for, for improvement, it has to be improved. Because uh, to the education, you had to add the quality, the segregation, and the access for those that needed the most. So what are those deliberate changes that you can make? What are the programs that you can start? What are the conversations that you can have with those who are involved um, with education? When it's going to equality, Let's, let's make uh, 
uh, education affordable for all our residents. Let's, let's be equal. Let's bring the minority community, the black community, community. Let's, let's give it the same support to no minorities and minorities. Let's, let's provide that quality education because that's gonna help the, the county economy. Education, right now our workforce, our children are not educated well enough to, to get to the level of the 21st century. And that is in, impacting our economy in a negative way. Also, we have to diversify our economy. And the way to diversify our economy, we have to provide our children with a better education. And now I will give you an example. I have three children because diversifying the economy don't start just to, with bringing just uh, uh, other industry. It has to start with us, with our people, empower our people with their education. I have three children. The oldest one, she has a, uh, a bachelor's degree in psychology. She has a master's degree on uh, social work. So she is in that industry at this moment. My son is the middle one. He works for the FAA and also going to college for computer science. Now we are diversifying. My youngest one, she is on health and science in the medicine area. So now we have, and now we're gonna, we're gonna take it to the county. Now we have a, an anti-care, we continue growing. Now we have the FAA over there that have a lot of jobs opportunity when in, most of our residents are thirsty for jobs. And those jobs are available at the FAA. But we have to bring our residents, our children to the level where they can uh, be able to work and obtain those jobs. And that's when quality comes in. That's where diversification in our economy comes in. It's how to start with our people, with our education. What are the three priorities that you have that you want your voters to know that you stand for? The first thing is our people. Our people are our greatest assets. We have to make sure our health is well, mental, physical, and that we are capable to have a great education. That we can come together as one. That that systemic racism that exists in our county get out of the door so we can work together. So equality can uh, take a big place in our society. So we can resolve our social issues and economic issues so we can develop sustainable economy. We have what it takes to, to, to move to the next level of economic development in our county, sustainable economic development. We have what it takes, but yes, we still have high taxes. We still don't have access to good quality education. We still have an opioid crisis, and that, those are my main concerns. Let's educate our children, our workforce. Let's use what we have to get what we need. I mean, we have forget, or our, our, we have farms over here. Micro farming and farming even reduce pollution and eliminate hunger. Sustainable economic development in both people, environment, and profit. And we have all of them. We can bring it, we have it, and we can do better in this county if we apply it. So we cannot continue doing the same thing, electing the same people and getting the same results because it's our fault. We're going to continue being insane and just going to end up in insanity. Our county is worth it. Let's spread the worst, but let's take care of our people. 
That's the first thing that we have to do. So police accountability is a hot topic right now. Where do you fit in with that conversation? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Police accountability, it's a hot topic right now. What are your opinions? Um, how do you see the city moving forward um, after recent events? I mean, we have to, to, to start policing our police. I know a lot of people have a conversation in defunding the police. I mean, I think there's some departments that you can touch and it's the te our teachers, our police department, our, our firefighters, you know, our healthcare system. I mean, you cannot uh, play with those funds for those, for those areas. When it comes to the police, again, racism is engraved into those problems. Bringing more minorities to having the, the, what to say in the policies when it comes to the police department, taking that brutality, make police accountable for their actions. I mean, we have to ban the shock holders. We have to create new policies. And there's no way that somebody that is already handcuffed is out of threat. According to them, there's not a threat. When you handcuff, you're not a threat. There's no need for brutality. We have to create stronger policies for our police. But we have to think that and, and know that not all of them are the same, but policies have to be put in place. And I can do that. You have a lot of ideas for policies um, and, and just concerns and values for the community. How do you uh, filter down your opinions to the community? Because oftentimes we hear that I've got people representing me, but I don't know who they are, I never see them. Um, what's your mode of communication when talking to your voters? To be practical, because uh, this is what is different when it's come to me, and, and I can share that. I'm not just a candidate, I'm a community leader. I have been involved in every issue that goes from minorities and no minorities in this county. And being, uh, and being close and outreaching that community every day and have that connection and that relationship is very important. So not just a candidate that come in an election time, but a leader that create leaders, no followers, and can call, coach, build, and deliver every day and have that relationship with the community. So okay. when, when I go out there, I'm sorry, it, it's like, I know who is she? I don't know her. But if you, if you can read a little bit about me, if you see this face, you're gonna find me everywhere. If that connects you, that care and concern for our residents and for our county, for our community. So you have about 30 seconds left. Are there any closing remarks that you'd like to give your voters before you leave? Yes, it's, it's for the best interest of our elected officials, our small business and our community leaders from minorities and no minorities to come together, especially in a time like this, to work together. Nobody can do it alone. Let's work together. Let's live in, in peace and believe in each other and change the situation. Let's not continue electing the same people. Let's not continue doing the same thing because we're gonna end up with the same result. I ask you for your vote on July 7th and November 6th. Please give us the opportunity to bring that needed change in our county. Thank you. Thank you for your time and have a nice night. You too, thank you very much.
Good evening, everyone. We have with us uh, John Risley, um, who is running for Atlantic County Freeholder at large. John, if you'd like to give two minutes to dig into your opening remarks, now will be the time. Sure, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Atlantic County Freeholder John Risley, and I'm sincerely asking for your continued support for re-election to the Board of Freeholders. My lifelong passion has all been about public service. I have served on Summers Point Council, Linwood City Council, Egg Harbor Township Committee, and uh, this is my 19th year of service as Atlantic County Freeholder. So it's something that uh, I'm proud of. It's something that I, I give back. Uh, by profession, I am a owner of a small independent investment firm, L.O. Thomas & Company in Linwood. The firm is 90 years old. We're a small independent firm. Um, our Atlantic County, which I've been a part of for many, many years, the county government is well run and well managed. Uh, the proof of that has been the recent reaffirmation of our bond ratings through Standard and & Poor's and Moody's. We have a very, very strong bond rating, which we've kept so that, you know, we can meet the challenges that we face. And Atlantic County has been through a lot of challenges, as you know, and we've stayed strong by prudent management of our county. Um, it, it's something that uh, we're very proud of. I've always been uh, strong on economics. I believe that, you know, a strong economy and a, a job market with opportunities. And, you know, opportunities don't always mean necessarily dollars. Opportunities can mean lots of things in lots of different ways. So I want to create as many opportunities in Lanning County as we can. One of the things I've been most proud of is my work on the South Jersey Economic Development District. Uh, you may not know this, but the property that now houses one of our buildings at the National Aviation Research and Technology Park that we opened, that property was part of a four county uh, contingent. So it was not Atlantic County, this was part of a four county uh, deal. And the district was near bankruptcy. I spent a number of years working with the other members to put that train back on the track and to uh, have that as a, an economic engine for us. So we have the National Aviation Research and Technology Park. We've completed the first building, it's 100% occupied and we're looking to uh, build another one soon. So to in increase our, our employment here. I would like to, to also address, uh, you know, the, the murder of Mr. Floyd. Um, the only words I can come up with is horrible and heartbreaking. Uh, as a county freeholder board, we don't have a police force. What we can do though, however, is advocate for grant funding for the cities. We do have a sheriff's department. The sheriff's department though is responsible for the courts, the safety of the courts and the accused. But uh, the county does not have a police force. So we will do everything we can to uh, improve our uh, police in Atlantic County but that primarily rests with A, the mayors and councils of the various cities, uh, the state legislature that could make changes to the state police academy and the governor's office. So uh, those changes need to happen. We all know they need to happen. And that's something that uh, I support. I'm uh, very passionate about our county. I am a uh, proud descendant of some of the oldest families here in Atlantic County, uh, the Risleys and the Leeds, and uh, we've been here a long time and uh, I'm gonna live the rest of my life here. I'm committed to this area, an area that I love so deeply. And that is uh, why I've been uh, put my, basically my whole life into uh, public service. Uh, I believe in giving back. Thank you. The legislature recently passed in December 2019, a law which removes the prohibition on voting 
by those convicted of an indictable offense who are on parole or probation. How do you intend to spread that information um, around the community? Well, at the Board of Freeholders, we discuss laws. We discuss uh, uh, changes to laws. Uh, we don't have any power to change them, but we discuss the newly signed bills many times. And uh, there's discussion and the press many times picks it up and runs with it. And that's how the, uh, the community at large would know basically about changes that the, the governor and the legislature have voted on. There's a bill that proposes a constitutional amendment to legalize cannabis for personal non-medical use by adults who are over the age of 21. Would you consider drafting a policy statement in support of this? Uh, what is your opinion around this bill? Well, again, that's a, that's a state issue. Um, I am not necessarily in favor of legalization. Uh, I think uh, we can certainly talk about decriminalization. I certainly would be in favor of that. Uh, there's going to be a ballot question in November, and the voters will uh, make make their decision. And whatever their decision is, is the, will be the law of the land. It has been brought to the attention of the Atlantic County Freehold Board that other townships in New Jersey pay the postage on mail and ballots for each election. What is your position on funding to cover postage paid on ballots for the county? Well, if we're directed to pay for it, we have to pay for it. I mean, somebody's got to pay for it, whether it comes out of the county's pocket or the state pocket or the uh, municipal pocket, it's still our tax dollars. It, it all comes back to our tax dollars. And, you know, in New Jersey, we have chased a lot of people out of the state because of high taxes. And that's unfortunate. And uh, I am currently total disagreement with our governor, who states that if you don't like high taxes, well, maybe this isn't the place to be. I, um, I totally disagree with that. You know, we here in South Jersey have had it rough. We're not involved in the economic corridor that these big cities are. When you draw that line from Washington, D.C. to Boston, that's where the main economics and opportunities exist in the Northeast. We're down here in South Jersey. We're, we're a dead end, quite frankly, economically. And we have to fight for everything we have here. So we have to try to maintain taxes as low as possible. And that's why on the Board of Freeholders, we have tried to maintain a very low tax rate. This year has basically come in flat and we try to achieve that each and every year. We try to come in with either absolutely a minimal raise or a flat. So there's no increase to the taxpayers of the county. So I just wanna make sure I understand your position sure. on this. Um, are, would you support covering the postage or or would you not support it? Well, who's going to pay for being it? being directed <laughs> to do it. Okay. Uh, we're directed to do it. You have to do it. I mean, uh, it's got to be paid. That's the way the, the state has set it up. I, I disagree with these um, not being able to go to the polls to vote like we normally do. I disagree totally. I mean, I believe that can be done safely. Uh, you can go in and, you know, take a, a glove and sign your name and push a button and leave. Um, that's, that shouldn't be uh, a problem. I, I don't like all these mail-in ballots. Uh, number one, it's going to take forever for the election officials to count. Uh, but there's, you know, there's mischief that can occur with that. We all know about that. So I want to switch topics to education, um, whether it be in your direct purview or not. Um, are you okay with uh, education? Is there room for improvement? Um, what are the kind of programs that you think are needed in the community? Well, again, uh, the Board of Freeholders did something that the state government could not do. 
and that's quite frankly back the bonds on the Stockton University in Atlantic City. The state of New Jersey has a very poor bond rating and we have stepped up to the plate to make sure that that building happened in Atlantic City. It was important. It was important to happen in Atlantic City and we were all in agreement with that. We, we stuck our necks out, we backed the bonds, and now we have Stockton University in Atlantic City, and uh, it's, it's been a, a real plus for the area, and I'm very proud of it. We're also proud of, uh, uh, of our other two county institutions, three county institutions, our community, community college. Very proud of that. We've been uh, spending more money out there recently. If you take a walk around the campus, you'll see the improvements that we've made. Uh, with the community college we have the special services school district which services that unique you know uh, population and then of course we have um, uh, ACIT so we're, we're proud of the uh, different things the education that we have so what would be your top three priorities that you want um, your community to know that um, that that's on your list to deal with well, I think number one is to continue to work for a strong economy, opportunities, jobs, uh, because with that cures a lot of social programs, a lot of social problems. It brings more money into the area. It provides opportunities for, for a future, for careers, for so many things. So many good things come out of a strong economy, good healthy economy. So that's very, very important. Um, taxes, keeping taxes level, that's crucially important. Uh, you know, our way of life here, the air we breathe, the environment in this area is part of the reason why I believe many people live here. And I've always been a, a strong supporter of veterans. I was uh, proud to have proposed the creation of the veteran service officer some years ago, which is uh, Mr. Furlow and Bob Furlow, and uh, I'm very proud of that fact that uh, I was able to get that through and get it accomplished. So they're the things that, that I believe in. So police accountability is a hot topic right now. Um, I can imagine you're having these conversations. Um, what is your opinion on what we can do um, about it? Uh, do you have a plan, um, ideally at least? Well, I think accountability, of course, is, is crucial. I think a lot of things in life come down to management. And it's important for police chiefs and mayors and councils to stay on top of this topic. Uh, if a police officer is uh, burned out, and I'm sure police officers do suffer from burnout, it's a very stressful job, not a job that I would necessarily want to do but somebody has to do it. Um, I think that has to be looked at. If a police officer is burned out, maybe it's time for a, a desk job or some other type of position, an investigator or whatever in the police department. But I, I think it's important that we have training and professionalism you know, in every industry, whatever industry you're in, whether you're an attorney, whether you're a investment guy like myself or a police officer. Uh, professionalism is the, the key here. And maybe the state police academy needs to be lengthened from the current 24 weeks. Maybe it needs to be lengthened. And that's something that the governor and the assembly should really take up. So yes, um, what we can do, like I said before, as a county, is we certainly can uh, be sure we apply for every opportunity to uh, secure monies to assist our local police departments. I uh, would certainly, certainly be in favor of doing that, yes. So you have a, a lot of ideas. How are you making sure that you're communicating that um, with the community that you represent? Well, I normally do a lot of shoe le leather, quite frankly. <laughs> I speak before a lot of uh, organizations, whether it be the, the Rotary or uh, I'm involved with uh, veterans groups or whatever it happens to be. 
I've been a uh, door to door campaigner. I've been um, a person that is in the community moving around and uh, um, that's what I enjoy doing meeting people. So finally, you have about a minute left. What would be your closing remarks? Well, thank you. I just want to thank you for the, this opportunity. And this is the first time I've used Zoom. <laughs> so this is an experience for me. We've been using WebEx in the county. And quite frankly, this is uh, much uh, smoother than WebEx. Uh, but uh, I would like uh, the voters to please to, to look at my record over the years. Uh, experience matters. Experience counts. With all the challenges we have today, this is not a time for on-the-job training. This is a time for elected officials who have the uh, statesmanship ability to do the research, to get the data, to think things out. I like to ponder things because uh, normally your first impressions and thoughts to try to fix something are usually the wrong ones. So um, I'm a person that likes to ask other people their opinions and put it together and do the research, do the data. I've written uh, three reports uh, as a freeholder. Um, so it's something that uh, I'm very passionate about. So I thank you for your time. We thank you for your time. Have a nice night. Thank you very much. We want to thank everyone to, uh, for continuing to join us. We're going to take a two, three minute break um, and we'll be right back to complete the night.
All right, good evening, everyone. We are back. We have James Toto with us, who is uh, also running for Atlanta County Freeholder at large. James, can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Me? We can hear you perfectly. It doesn't look like your video is on. Uh, there we go. How's that better? Yep, there you are. Thanks. Okay, great. So uh, we have two minutes for opening remarks. What would you like for um, everyone to hear? Well, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is James Toto, and I am running for the freeholder in Atlanta County as a veteran of the United States Army and a former federal air marshal and councilman in Summers Point. I've always been driven to serve. I'm a married father of three, and I reside in Summers Point. I retired from the U.S. Air Marshal Service and took a job in the Ocean City Public, uh, Department of Public Works, and that's where I'm currently employed today. I'm an active volunteer in the community. My wife Beverly and I spend our weekends helping others and ensuring that the residents of Atlanta County can benefit from the wonderful things that we have to offer here. I'm running for freeholder because we can take Atlanta County higher. We have done so much good work here, but there is much more work left to be done. I want to use my experience in aviation to work to expand the aviation, the National Aviation Research and Technology Park. I want to do more for our veterans. We have given so much in the service of our nation, partnering with Con Congressman Van Drew, the county can seek federal resources to improve the care for our veterans, which they so rightfully deserve. Finally, I want to work to make Atlanta County a hub for green energy and green jobs. Our ACUA is a leader in wind power and environmental conservation. I want to expand those opportunities even further so we can bring jobs and opportunities to Atlanta County and leave a better environment for our children. Together, we can take Atlantic, higher, Atlantic County higher, and we can succeed together. Great, thank you. So the first question is this. In December of 2019, the legislature passed a law which removes the prohibition on voting by those convicted of indictable offenses who are on parole or probation. How do you intend to spread the word about this? That's primarily the job of the county clerk, and it, it should go that way. If there are different outreaches in the community through, whether it's through churches or through uh, local organizations, that would be an, another uh, outlet to get the word out. That's pretty much my point on it. Uh, do you think that there's space for you to assist in spreading that word, or, or do you just prefer to leave it um, to that department? Oh, I'm prepared to help get the word out as, as best we can in, in different, different avenues of communication, whether it's social media or through, uh, different outlets that are out there. There is a proposal uh, to amend the constitution to legalize cannabis for personal non-medical use by adults who are aged 21 years or older. Would you consider drafting a policy statement in support? Why or why not? I'm not in support of legalization of recreational marijuana. I am in favor of decriminalizing it. And I am in favor of the uh, medical marijuana for treatment such as uh, MS, cancer, PTSD, along those lines. It's, you know, as long as a medical doctor is prescribing it, that's the, that's the correct avenue to go down with that, in my opinion. It has been brought to the attention of the Atlantic County Freehold Board that other townships in New Jersey pay the postage on mail-in ballots for each election. What is your position on funding to cover postage paid on ballots for the county? I, I firmly believe that everyone has the right to vote. As a veteran, I fought for that right. And as a U.S. Marshal, a U.S. Federal Air Marshal, I defended that right here in, in the United States. Um, I'm for the county paying for it. If that's the, if that's the, the means to the ends to, to making it happen, everyone has the right to vote and yeah, the county should pay for it. 
Do you have any priorities as it concerns education? Do you think that there is room for improvement um, in taking a, a hard look at the way we educate our students locally? There's always room for improvement in every, everywhere. You know, in, in no matter what profession we're looking at, um, one thing we used to say in the arm masters during training is, what'd you see, what'd you do, what would you do differently? We could take that approach of education is, what do you see, what are we doing, and what should we be doing differently to educate our children? The teachers of Atlantic City are phenomenal. They're really talented. Unfortunately, Phil Murphy has decided to cut a lot of funding to our schools. And it's, it's really, it's, you're, you're taking the tools away from, from our skilled craftsmen that are teachers. And they, they need the funding to help support the, the kids of Atlantic City and Atlantic County. So uh, that's pretty much my view on it, that you know, we just need to, you know, there are, there are ways of improving. Ask the teachers. They're the ones who are, are in the classrooms. They're the experts on it. And I'm more than, more than willing and able to listen to somebody and take their opinions and go from there. In your introduction, you listed a number of concerns that you had. If you could just kind of distill your concerns into, say, three priorities, um, what would they be? And kind of dig into uh, how you think you can move the ball forward on that. Uh, well, number one, our veterans. Uh, PTSD and our suicide rate is extremely high amongst veterans. 22 veterans a day commit suicide, and that's unacceptable. We really aren't. We are really not doing anything for them for that. And we need to bring a little bit more of awareness to PTSD as to what's going on with that with our veterans, especially now with like the COVID-19. There were a lot of people that were suffering from depression and PTSD, and things were getting worse. And the suicide rate was going a little bit higher, not just amongst the veterans, but amongst the regular, you know, non-veterans. Um, that needs to be addressed. They're, the veterans are the ones who provide us the freedom that we have today. Another priority for me is the aviation. Uh, reaching out to the schools, we, we discussed that earlier with the, how we can improve the schools, the STEM program, improving that across the board, bringing that across the county. You know, Atlantic, Atlantic City has a lot of talented kids. Get them into a STEM program and broaden their horizons that way. That will create jobs. It provides more opportunities. Green uh, Another one of my priorities is green jobs. You know, whether it's solar or wind. Um, they were just talking today about wind energy. There's a lot of different job creations that can go along with that. And I think that Atlantic County led the way with the windmills. I think we lead the way with other priorities here in, in the state of New Jersey, which would create jobs and create energy at the same time. Police accountability is a hot topic. Do you have any opinion on, on how this should be improved, if you think it should be improved at all? Um, what is it that you can do uh, to address police accountability? Oh, uh, that all starts locally. Um, pretty much the local departments, use of force policy, training, be able to talk to the officers, find out what they're doing, where they're coming from. I also firmly believe from my military experience and my experience in law enforcement, you need to have a diverse work crew, a diverse police force that can speak intelligently on multiple levels from different experiences and how they were, you know, in, in the communities that they come from. And it starts locally. You, you know, when you have somebody that was born and raised in Atlantic City, you know, I boxed with a couple of guys out of the PAL that are local AC cops now. And it's, you know, they're, they're in their community. They're known there. They're really good guys and they're, they're in touch and the kids, you know, kids coming up, trust them. And they are, these are good guys that have the right training and they know how to, they know how to do the community policing. So it all starts with training now. It starts locally. So you have a, a lot of ideas um, for moving the ball forward in a number of different areas. What's your mode of communication and making sure that those folks who you represent all have a good solid understanding of what you stand for um, and things that are coming down the pipeline? I'm involved in, in several different communities. I, I used to coach 
in Summers Point. Uh, I coach football, I coach baseball. In Atlantic City, I'm involved with the Art Thornton Ice Hockey Foundation. I'm involved with Teens in Transition. You know, I, I, I still go to the pound work out there. It's just communication, being able to talk to people and get an understanding. I'm not looking to change anybody's mind, but I want to be able to understand people better. Communication is the key to everything, whether it's a relationship or your job or however it is you relate. Communication is key. So I reach out to people that way and you can get involved and get involved in the communities and do an outreach that way. As part of your introduction, um, I believe you referenced um, some priorities as it concerned clean energy. Can you dig into that a little bit? Um, what, what do you have planned um, to address clean energy or clean air? ACUA with the, the, the wind program, the, the, the new windmills that are being proposed by uh, Governor Murphy. Uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. There's also a lot of different opportunity um, that's being used over in Europe right now with uh, basically turning garbage into energy through uh, incinerators. There's a lot of different things that I, there's folks I'm in contact with that are over in, believe it or not, of all places, Great Britain and Uganda, um, that, are, that are using this to, to help create power. So, and th these are just different ideas that if they're viable here, I'm all for it. If not, we can you know, go on to the next thing. What's the next thing that's up and coming? We need to, you know, Atlanta County can lead the way in this, not just locally, but nationally. And it's, a, it's better for jobs, too. In talking to the people that you represent, what are some of the concerns that they're having? Um, and how do you plan to address that? Well, the number one thing that's, that, that's on everybody's mind right now is unemployment, the economy. Um, you know, one out of every three people is unemployed in, in Atlanta County, and it's, you know, we need to get people back to work. I, I understand that uh, there was some kind of reduction of the, the, the taxes for the casinos here in Atlanta County, and, you know, we need to get everything open now. I don't know why Governor Murphy's delight, decided to delay opening the bars and everything, you know, today, or not bars, but the restaurants today. He should have done it on Friday. The, the restaurants could have had another weekend of hopefully profitability and next week is going to be uh, hair salons and, and other things like that. You know, we down here in Atlanta County, we depend on tourism. We need this. This is, this is a part of our lifeblood here. Um, and it's, you know, Murphy really, in my opinion, dropped the ball on it. You know, the, the county and the uh, County Executive and the Freeholder Board was, was going forward to, to tell Murphy, look, we've got a solution here. And he wasn't listening at all. So, you know, we've, that's part of it. So I think that you have um, expressed uh, a number of concerns, a number of issues that you'd like to, to, to address. What are the couple of things that have gone well that you want to continue to implement um, if you are to get this role as Atlanta County Freeholder? Uh, well, I was extremely successful with the COVID-19 testing in Summers Point. Um, we kind of led the way in that. I was, you know, weeks before I even started here in Atlanta County, I was, I was already talking to outside sources to bring COVID-19 testing here. Uh, it's just a matter of, we, we, outso you know, we went to an outside company that was forward thinking that was thinking outside of the box, bring it here to Atlanta County. It was through an, either through the insurance companies or through Medicare and Medicaid, get the people tested and find out where we're going with it and be able to discover what's going on with it. And we, we were able to move forward from there. One of the things that we developed in Summer's Point was the marina. Uh, it's a, now a tourist, uh, not, I don't, don't wanna say attraction, but it's one more thing for, it's another vehicle for people to come into Summer's Point to visit our restaurants, to go to our, our, our local theater, to you know, go and experience family time in Summer's Point. So we'd like to give you a minute for closing remarks. Um, what is it that you want your voters to know about you? Um, <laughs> I am, look, I, I'm a simple man of people. I'm not a career politician. 
this is, you know, I, I, I got into politics because I wanted my road paved and I got ticked off. So I, I wanted it done and you know what? I ended up getting five other, five other uh, roads paved before mine. But uh, it, it was, a, I have a better understanding of government now and how it works. I can actually serve, you know, better that way. Um, it makes me a little bit more qualified I'm involved in public works. I'm, I was involved with engineering. I was in, you know, my background is extremely diverse and I have a passion for serving people. You know, whether it was the air marshal program or with the army or it's volunteer coaching, I still go back to the PAL in Atlantic City now to help, you know, I give back to the fighters who are coming up now. There's so many back when I was a young fighter, they trained me and it's, you know, there's, I speak to a lot of different people on a lot of different levels. And it's, uh, I'm of the people, by the people, and I'm certainly most for the people. Thank you for spending your night with us. And uh, we hope that you have a nice night. Thank you very much for your time. I do appreciate it. And uh, please get to know me. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. We are rolling right along. Next, we have Karen Fitzpatrick, uh, who is also running for Atlantic County Freeholder at large. Before she starts, we just wanna give you guys um, a couple of minutes to take a look at her bio, and then we will get started. All right, let's get started. I apologize, I did jump the gun a little bit. Karen, if you could just unmute yourself. Thank you for being here. Hi, Sierra. Hi, so we are going to give you two minutes for your opening remarks. You can start when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much for having me tonight. Um, I've lived in Atlantic County all my life. I was raised here, I went to school here, I raised my family here. And I know what residents of Atlantic County are facing because I've faced the same issues myself. I've worked the phones at Atlantic Electric, I've served food at, at the casinos, and I've owned a couple of small businesses. But I knew I wanted more for myself and my family, so I started a 14-year journey of nights and weekends at college, culminating with a master's degree from Stockton University. I've managed multi-million dollar budgets for years, and I know a good spend versus a bad one, or an old one. Let's face it, 90% of the county's $217 million budget is spoken for, with salaries, benefits, roads, and bridges. But the other 10% is up to priorities. What are the priorities of the residents of Atlantic County? More jobs, fewer foreclosures, a clean environment, a place where all voices are heard. We have many of the pieces of success right here, some without millions of dollars of investment needed. Let's exhaust what we have before committing new funding. 
This is kitchen table economics at its most basic level. Use what you have before buying new. Pretty unusual for a Democrat, right? My opponents will say the Democrats never bring these issues forward, but there's no bipartisan brainstorming among freeholders. We need a new way of thinking. So I've gone straight to the people. What do you need? What do you want? And you've answered me and together we've made some changes. There's much more work to do and that's why I'm asking you to send me back to the Board of Chosen Freeholders in Atlantic County to continue to work for you. Thank you. Thank you. The first question is this. The legislature passed in December of 2019, a law which removes the prohibition on voting by those convicted of indictable offenses who are on parole or probation. How do you intend to spread the word um, on this crucial change? Well, it seems to me that parole officers and probation officers would have that information when they orient their new clients and they should receive that information as they're leaving incarceration. Additionally, we can use social media, we can use uh, press releases, get it out to the press and television stations, and we can talk about it in our government meetings. But basically, uh, the, uh, the people should know this as they're re-entering the world, what their rights are. There is currently a bill that proposes a constitutional amendment to legalize cannabis for personal non-medical use by adults who are aged 21 years or older. Would you consider drafting a policy statement in support of this? Why or why not? I would. I fully support legalization of marijuana for adult use. I don't believe it's reasonable to uh, ruin someone's life for smoking pot as a teenager. I also believe that marijuana could be what we, what we now know is what aspirin is, almost a miracle drug. As we've heard tonight, marijuana is prescribed for anxiety, for nausea from cancer, for all, a litany of illnesses and symptoms. And I believe that it can be regulated much the same as alcohol is regulated. This is for adults only, and I fully support it. It has been brought to the attention of the Atlantic County Freehold Board that other townships in New Jersey pay the postage on mail-in ballots for each election. What is your position on funding to cover postage paid on ballots for the county? I think that uh, allowing or enabling more people to vote is the government's responsibility. Everyone who is eligible to vote should be able to vote. And if the cost of a postage stamp enables more people to vote, then we should do that. Additionally, I think that vote by mail uh, is, is a more widespread um, uh, access to voting for people, especially in the pandemic situation. We heard that in Wisconsin where people decided they want to go to the poll, they had a spike in coronavirus infections. So I think in this situation, especially now, voting by mail is better for our, our population and will enable more people to vote. What are your concerns, if any, um, about our education um, in our local schools? Is there room for improvement? Um, if so, how do you see that improving? There's always room for improvement. I am very passionate about education. As I mentioned, I spent 14 years uh, getting my education as an adult. I'm an adult learner. And um, as my uh, colleague said, New Jersey is one of the most segregated states in public school in the country. And we have that problem here in Atlantic County as well. I think what needs to happen is uh, we have to break that system open where public schools are funded by property taxes. That creates an inequity based on property values. Children should receive the same education as their neighbors who live a mere five miles away, and they often do not. And it's not a kid's fault you know, or problem where he happens to be born or she. So um, yes, I do believe that there are inequities in our school systems, but I think that we are working toward, and I have been involved in some 
uh, pro, uh, mm, some uh, programs to uh, bring this to the attention of government and to see how we can in, uh, make change. And rather than create keeping segregation and moving, taking schools out of sending districts, mixing up uh, students and um, creating more equal edu educational opportunities for all children. If you could distill all of your priorities down to just three, what would they be? And then what would the action that you would take to address those priorities? Sure. Um, well, my first one is transparency. And I've done that already on the freeholder board by um, having evening meetings scheduled so that working people can attend our meetings. Meetings used to be at four o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesdays when a lot of people are working and can't access their government. Uh, can also, in that, in that light, um, it's it's very difficult sometimes to navigate the systems in the county. They seem to be in a bubble where people who are in the know are in the know all the way and people who are not in the know are not. And they have, they have a difficult time piercing the bubble. So transparency is the first one. The second one is economic development. We've talked a lot about diversifying our economy here in Atlantic County with the aviation park and uh, aeronautics and the FAA. I work in the tourism industry and it concerns me and bothers me that people want to discount the tourism agents uh, industry when that's what this or this area was founded on 150 years ago. We were founded as a destination and working in my industry. I have a lot of contact with colleagues all across the country. And what I've learned is that their counties help contribute to marketing the destinations that they serve. Now our destination, Atlantic City, is still the greatest economic driver in our county, yet we don't do anything at the county level to market it at, at a leisure, uh, for leisure visitors at all. And when you can get somebody to your destination, they're gonna wanna come back. And when they wanna come back, that's what makes business want to invest in the county. And when business invests, people will move here. And that I think is a great cycle that the county should look at a little more closely. And then thirdly, I like to focus on equality and that means a lot of different things. Educational equality, which we talked about, environmental equality, where all areas have the same access to clean water, clean air and a clean environment. Um, healthcare equality, we have a, a problem here in this county and in this state where black infant and maternal mortality is higher than in other states, and that needs to be addressed as well. Additionally, workforce equality, gender equality, racial equality in, in the workforce. Thank you. You're welcome. Police accountability is a hot topic. Do you have a plan to address this? Is there a space for you um, in this conversation, and what would your conversation be like? Sure. Well, we are fortunate in New Jersey to have as our attorney general, a person of color, which means he is, he is the person who creates the procedures for the police in the state of New Jersey, and then hands them down to the county prosecutors who then give them to the municipal police departments. And the county prosecutor can strengthen the attorney general's rules, but cannot weaken them. So I think that that's a good start. But what we have, since we have policies and procedures, what we also have are personal uh, beliefs and perceptions and the way people were raised and, and unconscious maybe uh, uh, actions and, and attitudes. And that's what needs to be addressed. We need to have a real conversation with all the people in leadership roles, including the police, about racism and uh, its, its uh, implicitness in, in how people act. And when I brought that up at the freeholder board this, this afternoon, I was told that that doesn't exist in the county government and it was because they, uh, the person who was speaking to me didn't want to, didn't believe that he was part of it. 
And that to me, that lack of self-awareness or self-examination is the root of the problem. We have to agree to be vulnerable at some time and look at ourselves honestly if we're gonna make any real change. So we have a lot of ideas that we're talking about now. Um, some of the concern in the community um, is, you know, I kind of know who the people are who represent me, but I never see them, or maybe I don't even know who they are. Uh, what would be your mode of communication and making sure that all people know about what you stand for and different things that are coming down the pipeline? How do you intend to distribute that information? Well, Sierra, I am, I am out there. I am a member of the Hispanic Association of Atlantic County. I'm a member of the NAACP in Atlantic City. I go to council meetings, school board meetings, committee meetings. If you invite me, I show up. I am available via email and telephone. People call me all the time. And the thing is, I call them back. And I email people and they email me back. I, I send out an email twice a week to communicate with all the residents of Atlantic County, no matter what party they are. So I, I am definitely out there and available and visible. Where do you stand with issues um, as it concerns clean air and clean energy? I brought forward a resolution this year to the freeholder board discussing just so, those issues. And one of the things I proposed was phasing out gas powered passenger vehicles that the staff use and replacing them with electric vehicles. I also talked about the county owns six huge underground oil tanks. And even though last year when we were having this conversation, I was told that they had many more years of life left. Two weeks ago at the freeholder meeting, the process began to dig two of them up in Hamilton and replace them with above ground tanks. Now, I'm not gonna get any credit for that, but I like to think I started the conversation. And the next one I'd like to talk about is the tank that's buried in Atlantic City. During your opening remarks, you mentioned um, that you know the community is speaking to you and, and, and you're listening and you're answering. What are those top three, or maybe top one, uh, concern of the community um, that you're hearing? Right now? Yes. Well, right now, I'm getting a lot of feedback about unemployment and how it's difficult to collect, um, how it's difficult to get in touch with people at unemployment. And I, try to help people navigate that system, but it's, it's difficult. And the other thing that I'm hearing a lot about more often than I, I am happy to hear about is um, people who have relatives in the county jail. And they're telling me that they're not being tested for COVID and they're not socially distant. I mean, I don't know how you can be socially distant in jail. And so when I bring this forward, um, to the administration, I am told that the administration is waiting for guidance from the state on how to deal with COVID in the county jail, and I can't get any further, and that's very disappointing to me. So we have um, some time left for uh, closing remarks. Um, if you'd like to just spend some time um, kind of just re-identifying who you are, um, reminding those folks of who you are, what you stand for, um, and anything else that you want to leave us with tonight. Thanks, Sierra. I appreciate it. I, I do want to thank you for inviting me and having me tonight. This is a great way for people to get to know their candidates and what they stand for. Um, in my two and a half years on the Board of Chosen Freeholders, I've been a voice for people who haven't had one before. I've partnered with the immigrant community, with environmentalists, and was able to have evening meetings scheduled for the public's convenience. When residents contact me, I listen. I answer my phone and my email. Not only do I listen, I hear. That's how I found out about missing bus shelters at the new Walmart in Egg Harbor Township. I investigated and made calls and they were installed so that people wouldn't have to wait for transportation in the rain or cold. That's the difference between me and my opponents. I listen and then I act. These actions may seem small, but they're important to the residents of Atlantic County. I listen to what residents want, and then I do what I can to make that happen. And as I told you, I'm a member of several organizations that are, do important work here in the county, and I get to as many meetings and events as I possibly can. But if people call me and ask me to come, I definitely show up and listen to what they need. 
Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. We thank you for spending part of your night with us. Absolutely. Have a nice night. You too. Good evening, everyone. We have with us um, Andrew Parker, who is also running for Atlantic County Freeholder District 3. Andrew, if you'd like to start off with uh, two minutes. I see her lips moving. Give him some time to get situated. Andrew, can you hear me? I can hear you now. All right, perfect. Um, so uh, thank you for, for spending part of your night with us. Thank you for having me. We'd like to give you two minutes for opening remarks. If you have anything um, you'd like for the viewers to know, um, this would be your time. Well, my name is Andrew Parker. I am a son, a brother. I'm being told to hold. All right, ready? My name is Andrew Parker. Uh, I'm a son, a brother, a cousin, a nephew, a husband, a father, a teacher, uh, and a businessman. I'm married with three kids, Devin, 19, sophomore at King's College, Anaya, 12, is an eighth grader, uh, Jayla uh, is nine year old, nine year old, and she's going into the fourth grade. I'm a lifelong uh, resident of Atlantic County. My parents moved from Atlantic City to Egg Harbor Township when I was around two years old. I'm a proud graduate of Egg Harbor Township High School, class of 1996, Silver Eagles. Um, I've been a teacher in Atlantic City Public Schools since 2008. Um, from 2010 to 2018, I was a member of the Zoning Board of Adjustments in Egg Harbor Township. And in 2018, I made history being the first Black uh, American elected to the governing body in Egg Harbor Township. Uh, also, I'm a member, a proud member of the NEA, National Education Association, where I just was elected as the NEA RA, Representative Assembly. Um, also, I am a Ready to Run alum. I also serve on the State Elections Committee for the NEA. I'm a member of the NJEA, uh, serve on the Legislative Action Team, uh, members of color, local evaluation committee, as well as the action team. With some of my union uh, background. In 2013, I was named one of Seaman STEM's Institute Fellows, which named one of the top 50 uh, math and science teachers of the year for that year, uh, brought to DC um, to uh, teach um, us how to bring an institute uh, STEM in our local districts. 
I'm a Prince Hall Mason and a Shriner. I'm a member of the NAACP mainland, mainland Pleasantville branch. I am a member of the Hispanic Association of Atlantic County. I'm a youth coach, coached all sports, football, basketball, baseball, track, you name it, even soccer, uh, which I have very little knowledge in, but my daughter was playing and he needed to coach, so I coached. Uh, brother to brother mentor, mentors meet. Um, lifetime member of the New Jersey Second Amendment Association. And uh, when I'm running on, I'm running for economic growth, job opportunity, and uh, diversity um, of our economy through social equity. Thank you. You're welcome. So the first question is this. The legislature recently passed in December of 2019 a law which removes the prohibition on voting by those convicted of indictable offenses who are on parole or probation. Mm. How do you plan to uh, get out this crucial information to the community? I think one of the ways that we can um, get the information out to the community is by passing a resolution um, here locally, um, recognizing whatever the new law is and by doing so, we can disseminate that down to the towns. It can go from the counties down to the towns, and then they could do the same thing and pass a resolution, and that way it gets out to the public through um, uh, the public forum. Um, also, we can ask the county clerks to send out a mailer. Um, that, that's you know, their responsibility and obligation to do that, so they can send out a mailer, um, especially to those people that are impacted by that law. We could also utilize um, civic and uh, social uh, services groups, um, community partnerships, uh, social media, I mean, um, and just being out and visible in the public, I suppose, you know, just being out there in the public and being accountable and being accessible, I'm sorry, to, to the public. So uh, talking to people and letting them know that there's something, there's a change in a, in a new law and uh, informing people of what that new law is. There is a proposal to make a constitutional amendment to legalize cannabis for personal non-medical use by adults um, who are 21 years or older. Do you consider drafting a policy statement in support of this? Why or why not? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll answer by saying this. Um, my two years as on the council in Egg Harbor Township, uh, we voted in favor of uh, having legalized, excuse me, having legalized dispensaries in Egg Harbor Township. We have one that's uh, running well now and we're happy with and um, we're, we're looking to, um, we're open to add more. We also drafted a letter to the state of New Jersey, letting the state of New Jersey know that we were in favor and in support of bringing medical dispensaries into our town. Um, now, this is a different question that you're asking. You're asking about recreational marijuana. And I, you know, that's, that's a tough one. You know, I, I don't, I'll say that I, I don't have any uh, feelings against anyone who is of uh, legal age um, using um, um, recreational marijuana. If we can uh, legally uh, drink and, and alcohol, which has proven in some cases to be worse um, for uh, society as far as um, accidents, as far as um, health-wise and things of that nature, domestic violence, then I wouldn't, I'm not opposed to um, having an adult make that adult decision for themselves um, and decriminalizing um, of marijuana. All those folks that uh, for years and years that have been incarcerated and continue to be car incarcerated, some of them and lives have been uh, drastically affected due to marijuana changes, um, um, marijuana laws, then that, that has to be addressed. Uh, I don't think that's Okay, I don't think that's fair, and I don't, and, and as a, and as a country, for us to now be considering or have legalized it in some places and considering uh, legalizing it in other places, and still have people uh, serving time um, and and having their freedom taken from them for the same thing. I know that the laws, you know, in the, the flip side of it, people will say, well, it was a, it was illegal when they did it, and and I do understand that, and and, and I would just say that I, I would venture to say that uh, they've served their time and. And, and we should do something to uh, give those people back their freedom and get their life somewhat back in order the best way we can. But would I be willing to draft a letter? I, I, you know, I don't know. 
I, I honestly don't know. I think that the voters will decide. It's a, it's going to be on a ballot for November, I believe, and the voters will decide. And I'm not one who believes that I know better than the voters. So what the voters decide to do, that's what we'll move forward for, and, and we'll do that. It has been brought to the attention of the Atlantic County Freehold Board, but other townships in New Jersey pay the postage on mail-in ballots for each election. What is your position on funding to cover postage paid on ballots for the county? Um, you know, I don't have a problem with the, the county uh, paying postage. I mean, you know, if we're, we're trying to get everyone to vote. We want everyone to have the right to vote. And I know that particularly um, as, a, as a, a black man in America, I know the, the you know, what we and our, our um, forefathers and foremothers went through in order to give us the right to vote. So that's something that I don't take, uh, take lightly. So anything that can help to get people engaged into this system and have their vote counted um, and have it fairly counted, you know, because along with that, with absentee ballots and things of that nature, you know, there's been a lot of scrutiny and a lot of um, uh, deceit, a lot of uh, corruption and things of that nature that need to be cleaned up. So as long as we clean up the system uh, we clean up the system and get everybody's uh, vote counted. I have no problems with uh, the county paying for that. I mean, as long as that's what the people want to do, as long as they understand that when the county and the municipal governments uh, pay for things, they're not paying out of their own pocket. They're paying with tax money that's collected from the citizens. So if we understand the correlation between those things, if the people want uh, that to be a, a service that's provided by the county, I have no, no issue with it. When you think about um, our local education system, what are your thoughts? Um, do you think that there is room for improvement? Um, what, if anything, can you add to the conversation um, when speaking about our, our education system? Well, talking about the education system, first I'll say, like I stated earlier, I am a, an educator um, in the Lang City Public School System, and my wife is an educator. and. Um, in, in Camden school system. So we, we work in two low socioeconomic um, um, towns in our, in our state and uh, th through two different counties. And we, you know, we see a different perspective on things. And um, we're, we're also very uh, active in the union. So as I stated earlier, I'm already uh, sitting at the table, you know, with um, negotiating and debating and deciding on what educational policies will be passed for the state of New Jersey and, and how the state of New Jersey is going to uh, recommend those policies to the National Education Association. So those are things that I'm already um, currently sitting at, at the table and doing and, and actively in the active role that I'm playing. With that, all that said, I'll say that education is, um, public education is ranked number one elementary education is ranked number one in our country in the state of New Jersey. So that's something that we should be proud of. And whereas though uh, I, I will never uh, shortchange that there's room for improvement, uh, which is why I'm so very active in the union and all of my union brothers and sisters know that I, I, I very passionately debate um, improving education in certain ways like STEM education, um, equity, um, project-based ba learning, hands-on learning. Uh, virtual learning is a big one. And here we are in virtual learning and it's something that I've been, you know, uh, pushing for the last, you know, five to six years or so, uh, trying to get us to move to more of a virtual learning situation because our children today learn different. You know, the, the, the kids today that are coming up, it's the first generation of kids that have never lived, you know, one day without having some sort of technology in their hand. Most of these kids are getting a tablet right out of, uh, right out of the hospital. So, I saw the five minutes go up, so I'll cut that short. So yes, it's uh, my answer. Yeah. I see um, you, Mike. <laughs> so uh, in your opening remarks, you kind of distilled your priorities down to three. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, increasing revenue in the area, the local area, mm -hmm. uh, increasing jobs. And there was a third one that I did not catch. But if you could just go into those three and kind of drill down on what specifically you're trying to do um, as it relates to those three areas. Absolutely. It's the same thing that I ran, same three things that I ran on two years ago uh, for Township Committee. Um, and I'll reiterate those. The first thing that I'm, that, I run, that I'm running for is the same thing I ran for before is economic development and bringing uh, commercial and industrial rateables 
um, to offset taxes. You know, everywhere that I go, I hear people, you know, every, every conversation that I have with uh, the community, they're saying taxes, 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 you know, lower my taxes, lower my taxes. And I say to them, listen, what, what do you want? What do you want to give up? What services don't you want us to provide? You know, what do you want us to take it from? You know, let's have a conversation about the specifics. And then I say, do you want us to touch, you know, take it from education? No, 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 don't touch education. Okay, do you want us to touch police? No, 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 don't touch policing. So what do you want us to take? Recreation. No, don't touch rec recreation. So we have a situation where a lot of people want to, uh, they, they're, up, they're not happy with what they're paying in taxes, but they also don't want to give up their services that are being provided to them. So the only thing that we can do other than lowering taxes is to offset that by increasing, you know, your, your economic uh, development and your, your, your rateables that you're bringing in. So if you look at what I've done in Egg Harbor Township for the first two years, I served as liaison of economic development for the first two years. We've done all kind of uh, developing in the township from the Atlantic County, uh, the Atlantic Care uh, Surgical Center to Royal Farms to, we have two Royal Farms, one's getting ready to open up, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, Bag of Bond, I just went there tonight. Um, we, we did a lot to help them come into Egg Harbor Township. So, you know, they were doing outstanding before COVID and now things have changed, but we went over tonight and they had a packed house. So that's one of the things, and there's, and there's others that I'm, that I'm not mentioning, but I'm trying to be respectful of time, but there's so many different projects uh, that I've worked on in the, in the two years and we were able to accomplish. We also uh, secured a grant, uh, an de economic development grant to redevelop the three shopping centers in Egg Harbor Township, which one of the main goals that I talked about in my campaign. And uh, a lot of people said that I, I overspoke it and it was something that I couldn't accomplish. And I'm going to say that I did not accomplish it. So I want to take credit. Uh, I'll say that we accomplished it. There was a team that was already there in place in Egg Harbor Township that was ready. Uh, and all it took for me was to be kind of uh, the annoying little brother that nobody wanted. And I got in and I started asking a bunch of questions and I kept on those questions. And so now we've secured that grant for those three shopping areas. So that's going to be coming up soon as well in a cover township. So what I'm running on, I'm running to continue that on the county level, uh, because without money, you know, without having job opportunities, without having diversity of uh, employment opportunities then, you know, we're all at a lost cause, you know, and, and no one's going to be happy with that condition. So um, that's what I'm running on. Social equity is also what, I, what I'm running on. And I, I saw I speak about social equity, uh, just to give a brief example, because a lot of people don't know what it is. Uh, social equity just pretty much states that whatever the percentage of the demographic of your town is. So for example, if your town is 11% uh, Black American, then 11% of your police department, 11% of your command structure, 11% of your fire department, 11% of the clerk's office, 11% of um, you know, public works, 11% of your school administrators, 11%, you know, it has to be reflective of the demographic of your town. So I think that um, if, if we diversify our economy and we include people through social equity practices, then everyone has a fair seat and a fair share at the table. Okay, um, another question. Police um, accountability is a hot topic. Mm -hmm. Do you have a plan to address this? What are your conversations sounding like when you're talking about this to the folks that you're representing? Well, first I'll say that I've been to uh, just about every one of the protests that we've had here locally. I was at the one in Lang City, the first one. Uh, I was at the Summers Point Ocean City uh, protest. I I'm also sorry, Andrew, please yes. forgive me. I think I missed the one minute. So if you want to have that answer and then wrap it up into your conclusion. I will you do. Can do that. Thank you. I will do. So in the service of policing, I've been at all the rallies. Um, the, 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 the one in Mays Landing, the one in Cover Township, I, I helped behind the scenes to organize as well. And, um, you know, I'm very proud of the peaceful protest. And, uh, and as I stated, when I was at the Mays Landing uh, protest, I was very happy to hear that it seemed like it was the, the, the emotion was starting to fade a little bit and people were starting to think of a plan. And so a plan was coming together to how to move forward. Um, and, and those plans are happening. I know that the federal government today um, put together a reform bill. I don't know how far it goes, if it goes far enough. One of the few things that I've heard so far from some of my constituents is it didn't go far enough in terms of the qualified immunity, which pretty much states that government officials, including like myself, uh, when we're performing discretionary functions, we have pretty much immunity. Um, and unless we can, without any doubt, prove 
that we were against uh, some, we broke someone's constitutional uh, right. So I'll, I see the other uh, Dr. Thelma Witherspoon's bio coming up. So I guess I'll leave it at that. The only other thing that I'll say is that uh, on a local level, and that's where I'm coming from, I think that every local municipality should take a look at their use of force policies. And when you looking at their use of force policies, making sure that those are up to date and, and reflective of what they want their policing to look like. Also social equity, because we need to hire police officers that come from the community, that know the community, that know, you know, when they see my son or my daughter on the corner or out there doing something, acting like a teenager, they don't end up in handcuffs. You know, they end up saying, hey, listen, I know your dad. Your dad wouldn't know you belong. You, you belong out here. You know, and that's what community policing used to be. And I think we need to bring that kind of policing back where the, the, the police officers in our community are from our community, they're reflective of our community, they know our community, so they have compassion for our communities. Thank you for spending your night with us. Thank you. Have a nice night. <laughs> you too. All right, good evening, everyone. We are uh, still here. Um, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Thelma Witherspoon um, running for Atlantic County Freeholder for District 3. We hope that you all had a chance to review her bio. Dr. Witherspoon, if you'd like to just take the first two minutes to get into your opening remarks, now would be the time. First, I want to thank the NAACP uh, Atlantic City and Mainland Division for having this virtual forum on tonight and for inviting me uh, to be a part of it. I, um, as you first stated, I am a candidate for the Atlantic County Freeholder District 3, which is most of Ed Carver Township and portions of Hamilton Township. I've been, I was born in Atlantic County. I've lived here all my life. I worked for the Atlantic City Police Department, retired from there, I was the former president of the Atlantic City Board of Education for a couple of years. I've loved serving the community and I'm looking forward, if elected by the residents of Atlantic, of, of Ed Carver Township and Hamilton Township as being the representative and the voice for all of the people. Thank you. So the first question is this. In December of 2019, the legislature passed a law which removes the prohibition on voting by those convicted of indictable offenses who are on parole or probation. How do you intend to um, pass along this information, this crucial information to your community members? Well, so right now, social media is our friend. Um, due to the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, it's been very difficult to get information out there, but everybody's on their phones. Everybody's on their tablets. And um, I'm one, if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, I put information out there for everyone. And that would be inclusive of people who had records or uh, anything of that nature. And now they have the opportunity and they're able to vote. Thanks to Governor Murphy. Thank you. There is a bill that proposes an amendment to the Constitution to legalize cannabis for personal non-medical use by adults who are over the age of 21.
Would you consider drafting a policy statement in support of this amendment? Why or why not? I'm, I am for, for medicinal cannabis, people who have medical issues, seizures, different things of that nature, and who need it, people who have cancer and are sick. I am actually for that. I'm not too, um, I, I'm not too, I, I'm not really for, I should say, for people with recreational. And I understand it is not, you know, with the studies that they don't um, have the same effect and they don't go to long time drugs, but I really don't know that. And with the drug problem that we have in America and in our community, I'm not really for people who are using it for recreational purposes because it's a gateway drug. It is said to be a gateway drug to other drugs. Thank you. It has been brought to the attention of the Atlantic County Freehold Board that other townships in New Jersey pay the postage on mail-in ballots for each election. What is your position on funding to cover postage paid on ballots for the county? Well, most, um, it is my understanding that most counties, um, Board of Elections or clerks pay for the postage anyway. Um, this is a mail-in ballot. It's, it's unprecedented. You know, I'm used to going to the machine and, and voting that way. But because of COVID-19, people can't vote that way. And they have to vote by the mail-in ballot. I think that um, all of the counties are miss and counties that have to pay for it, I think it is the right thing to do to make sure that every voice is heard. When we think about our local education system, um, you know, is there room for improvement? Um, what do you have to add to that conversation? There's always room for improvement. No matter how well we're doing, we can always do better. Uh, being a former president of the Board of Education in Atlantic City, there were a lot of great things that were done there. There are a lot of great things since I moved in this area in the school districts that are being done. But um, one thing that I've noticed and I'm not a school board member, this is really a school board member question, but what I see um, during this pandemic, a lot of the children who have disabilities um, have not received some of the same services, you know, that they would normally receive during uh, a regular school year. So I would like to see if this goes on, this pandemic, um, other ways that those children can receive services, and I think that that would make it whole. You know, there's a lot of things that we can improve on, um, but if you could distill all of your concerns and all of your policies into those top three priorities, um, what would they be, and what do you want the viewers to know about your position on those three um, uh, priorities? Can you repeat that question? What are your top three priorities? Just three. And um, oh, three. how do you intend to address them? Well, a few of my priorities, three of my priorities. Number one is the health uh, coronavirus. Is COVID-19 is really huge. And they're talking about another wave. I'm concerned about the public health for all, the old, the elderly, the young, those who are inmates, you know, in the county jail or in the nursing homes, what type of testing is being done for those who are behind bars or in nursing homes? How are we protecting them as well as our elderly and young? So that's one thing that I'm very concerned about. I'm concerned about testing for everyone, um, for everyone to, to receive a test. So that's one of my priorities, uh, that's public health. The other one is um, economic development. Everybody talks about that. <laughs> but really, um, supporting small businesses. A lot of the small businesses are, have suffered during this particular time. And I think it's very important uh, we as residents support the smaller businesses and women businesses and minority businesses. 
um, they're hurting. So I think that would be one of, another one of my um, priorities is making sure that we have uh, everything that we need to assist the smaller businesses. For me personally, um, I've been doing that, ordering food from local businesses, even with my campaign literature, ordering it from, it's good. It, yes, it's cheaper to do it outside of the city or outside of the county, but I've been supporting the local businesses in our community. And to me, that's how we make a stronger economy and rebuild Atlantic County. So police accountability is a hot topic right now. When you're talking to your community members, um, what do your conversations sound like around that topic? Well, everybody is not a bad cop, a bad police officer. Uh, I think that we need to support law enforcement, but not support wrong, not support brutality against anyone. Um, I, uh, I believe in reform. And a lot of things have come out of George Floyd's death. And one thing uh, for New Jersey, our policies had not been um, updated in 20 years. You know, so I'm for reform and, and making things better in our community. Community policing, you know, that's what I'm talking about uh, when I talk to people. Not, not dismantling the police department not defunding the police department, but reforming it and being a part of those conversations, having task force, you know, police task force, you know, with the community so that when you have issues, you can bring those up and you can work collaborative, collaboratively and cohesively together to resolve situations. Effective communication is crucial in getting out your policies and understanding the concerns of those that you represent. Um, you kind of touched on social media earlier. Um, what are ways in which um, you communicate with those that you represent? Um, you know, where does effective communication live at with you um, when it comes to dispersing the word? Well, communication is the key. It's number is number one, you know, with me, you sometimes if you can't effectively get your message across, then people really don't know what you stand for and what you do. Um, I'm right now, I, as I said earlier, I'm using social media to do that. A website, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, talking to people when I see them in Wawa or at Walmart. You know, constantly talking to people and communicating them about the issues and things that are very concerning to me for Atlanta County. When we talk about clean air and clean energy, um, what do you have to say about that? Do you have any priorities um, as it relates to the two? I don't have any priorities, but I do believe in clean air. I do like the windmills and the different things like that for the environment. You know, we got to protect the environment if we want to live longer and have clean air to breathe. I had the opportunity maybe about four years ago to go to India. And I didn't realize how important clean air was until I was there. And um, before, right now, we all are wearing masks, you know, to protect ourselves. But clean air is very, very important. And making sure that we have those things in place to make sure that the environment is safe. I'm very much for that. As you're talking to the community members, um, what are they telling you are their concerns? Basically, they're concerned about unemployment, getting back to work. Um, some are very fearful about COVID-19. You don't, you don't know if someone is asystematic. Or, you know, every time someone calls, you know, people are nervous and they're looking at everybody, you know, to see if they got it, looking at me to see if I got it. And, you know, you don't want to even sneeze, you know. So um, people are very concerned about that right now. And they want the economy to open back up, but they want to be safe, too. You know, so it seems like it's a double-edged sword. You know, if you open up too soon, if you don't open up fast enough, you know, 
Uh, I've been fortunate, but a lot of people, you know, have that I talked to have not received their unemployment since March. So they want to go back to work. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing when I talk to people. If you could just name one thing we've done wrong um, as it concerns policy change locally, um, and one thing we've gotten really right um, as it concerns policy change, what would they be? I would say sometimes we make decisions and without getting proper input. You know, sometimes um, people do the best that they can do, but I think that when we get input from the community, we can make a, um, a better choice or a better decision, I should say, on things that should be done. Um, that's one thing that I see. Um, one thing that I am seeing um, is the community starting to unite. You know, um, I did attend the uh, peaceful protest in Mays Landing. It was well organized. And to see people coming together from all walks of life, the young, I guess I'm a baby boomer, so I'm dating myself, but to see baby boomers and then millennials and then those younger than the millennials out there, um, it was just great to see people coming together wanting change. I think um, that's a great thing. And I believe if everybody works together, there can be a change, you know, and it's a great movement going on right now. And um, I want to be a part of that. And I want to be a part of the change. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. So you don't want to just be complaining about things. I want to be a part of the solution, not the problem. Um, you know, one way in galvanizing our youth, um, what would that be? Um, and I'm pretty sure Michael is going to put up the one minute sign soon. So if you want to answer that question and then um, close with your closing remarks, um, you, you, can, you can do that. I think that um, letting the youth have their voice, but also being there to guide them in the right way um, with their voice, not um, taking away from what they need to do, but letting the youth be who they are. Uh, there's a biblical quote. I call the young because they're strong. And I call the old because they know the way. And I think two coming together, the older people have wisdom. The younger people have um, zeal and motivation. And, and I think um, let them have that creativity, but with some guidance is the best way to be for me. And closing remarks? I want to thank uh, the Atlantic City NAACP and mainland uh, NAACP for having this virtual forum, um, thinking outside the box. Normally, we're at an auditorium or you know a place, but they came up with a way for people to hear the candidates and hear their voice, and I really appreciate it. I want people to um, follow me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and everything that I'm doing. And I would love for people to vote for me during this primary election. I'm coming up, make sure that you filled out your ballot. You know, I think that that's a very, very important thing to do. Vote column A. Thank you very much, Dr. Witherspoon. Thank you for spending your night with us. And at this Thank time, you. Thank you. At this time, I believe I'm going to turn it to uh, President Kaleem Shabazz um, and President Olivia Caldwell for closing remarks. Just have to unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Sierra, uh, so much for being our moderator today. Uh, as always, you were very efficient and professional, and we appreciate you. Thank you, Brother Bibb, for being our timekeeper. We're going to hire you and double your salary. Uh, I want to thank uh, my colleague, uh, uh, President Caldwell, all of our sponsors uh, and supporters. We thank all of the candidates for taking their time to come and present themselves. But we appreciate you. It's not easy being in the public sector and putting yourself up for election. We salute all of you, and we wish you all well in the primary. I want to thank uh, my partner and co-host on the radio program, uh, Yolanda Melville Esquire, for all of her technical expertise. We're going to double her salary also. 
and the, for you people who are listening, when I say double the salary, the NACP is a volunteer organization, so I'm not that good in math, but if we double the salary, that means that they're still volunteers. Uh, but we, we appreciate uh, everyone who has participated tonight. Uh, I would tell you, uh, before I get off that Thursday of this week, we're going to have uh, the congressional candidates uh, for District 2. We're going to have the candidates for sheriff, and we're going to have the candidate candidates for surrogate. Uh, opening at 6 o'clock, please tune in and hear all of the candidates. Lastly, 5.30. Uh, what, 5.30? 5.30 on Thursday. 5.30 on Thursday, uh, Yolanda Melville Esquire says. Uh, also, Friday, please, ma'am, and please, sir, Friday, join us at Martin Luther King Complex, uh, 1700 Memorial Avenue in Atlantic City at 12 o'clock noon for our In Caravan Juneteenth Black Lives Matter event featuring our young people in Atlantic City, sponsored by the Atlantic City NAACP. And I'm so happy to say you're also sponsored by the council person of the third ward and i think that is uh, Kaleem shabazz and we thank you uh yolanda i just want to say it was a fantastic night you all held a crowd on the facebook and i certainly thank both of you for um your diligence this was a community effort this was a, a, a really a partnership between the two branches and i do on behalf of the alliance the naacp normally we have charles goodman who is our political action chair, do our uh, candidates nights. And I do want to give a special shout out to him and wish him well. And uh, hopefully we can see you in the future. Okay. See you Thursday. Make sure you tune in at 5.30, correct? 5.30. And, and thank you, everyone. Um, I hope Friday, that Friday, Juneteenth. I'm sorry. Ms. Caldwell? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Colleen, you've already said everything. And what I do hope is that people are willing to set aside time on Friday so that they can hear the other um, candidates that are coming on. Thursday uh, for the candidates. Thursday, correct. Please Friday share, is Juneteenth. Please share it with uh, all of your contacts so that um, we are doing the service that we're here to do, which is to help to inform the public so that they can become an educated voter. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank everybody. Have a good evening. Everybody be safe. Good night. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm. Stop video. I just...